We are live. I'm turning it over to you, Salva. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, maybe we'll wait just a couple minutes just to make sure people have time to arrive. And then I'll give a brief introduction to the workshop and introduce the first speaker. Salva, is that puppy barking coming through to you? Yes, very faintly. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, maybe I should shut the windows just a moment. <laughs> we could barely hear it. So. So I see more people signing in, so we'll wait up just a bit more. Where are you right now, Lupi? I am in Bangalore. What time is it there? It's just about 7.30 p.m. Almost 10 hours difference. Yeah. Okay, so I think we can probably get started now. Uh, so welcome everybody uh, to the workshop. Uh, the title of the workshop today is Tools and Resources for Developing and Sharing Models in Computational Neuroscience. We are very excited about this uh, workshop and the list of speakers we managed to get. Uh, I think that the field is growing really fast and all the different tools and platforms are adding new features every um, very frequently, so it's a nice opportunity to see the latest advances in each of these tools. Um, the organizers of, of the workshop are Kale Dye from Allen Brain Institute, Audrey Gleason from UCL, and myself from the State University of New York. Uh, the workshop uh, will last uh, two days, so we have the schedule is available on sched.com and as well as in the website, as uh, so we have eight talks today from 10 a.m. New York time up to 3 p.m. and tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 2.30. We also have two discussion sessions, uh, one of them today at 12.30 New York, New York time and tomorrow at uh, 1 p.m. New York time. So we we hope that this uh, helps to uh, bring attention to all these new tools and how they complement each other, and also to find ways to interact uh, with the different tools and platforms. And without further ado, uh, just to remind you that if you want to ask uh, any questions, please post them to through the Ask a Question uh, link at the bottom of the screen. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, uh, Upi Bala, who is going to talk about uh, MUS, the multi scale object oriented simulation environment. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Saba. Uh, now, let me see how the share screen works here. 
application window. Um, I'm going to see if this works. Okay. And, and whoops. Do you see my uh, screen now? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, I'll get started. Good evening and good morning uh, to all of you. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the Moose project and um, the ecosystem, really, of many, many things that we've been doing with it and uh, building it up to make it uh, a, a, an effective system for doing data-driven multi-scale models. Um, so uh, here is, an, in a very, very brief slide, uh, a nutshell of what I'll be talking about. And I will uh, go over most of these, not all of them, in, in a little bit more detail. Um, there's Moose, but there's a whole range of other uh, tools that we've been building, uh, as I will describe, to be able to make models that are uh, accurate, um, that uh, replicate data effectively, um, and that cross many, many scales of representation. So um, let me start with Moose. Uh, Moose was a simulation project that we developed, that we began work on quite a few years ago. And uh, I've been working on it uh, in my lab, and we've been using it for doing simulations at the network level and at the, all the way down to the subcellular uh, molecular signaling level and everything in between. So the general idea of Moose is that one should be able to model everything from stochastic reaction diffusion chemistry to the complex signaling that goes on in spines and dendrites to the cellular biophysics uh, up to the large network level. And these are all examples of simulations that have been done with Moose. Uh, to accomplish this, Moose has a range of numerical engines ranging from uh, Gillespie-type uh, stochastic solvers to compartmental ODEs and uh, other solvers, uh, including reaction diffusion calculations, the usual uh, cellular biophysics, cable theory, Hodgkin-Huxley uh, dynamics, and so on, and up to uh, large networks with uh, synapses of various kinds. So these are all things that we are interested in. And I think it goes without saying this audience is obviously very familiar with the idea that brain computation does happen at many levels and that you really do need to pay attention sometimes to these levels across scales in order to figure out what's going on. So let me give a, a, a little example um, to start out with. Yeah, so here's an example of a very simplified neuron, a ball and stick model, and it's got a few small uh, steps in a signaling uh, cascade. Basically, calcium comes in um, through the uh, NMDA receptor. It binds to a very variety of signaling steps and activates uh, CAM kinase 2, which modulates receptor um, uh, conductances. Now, this, of course, will feed into uh, what this uh, little uh, cell will do in the context of recurring synaptic input. Uh, because uh, the idea is that you have your synaptic input that opens the receptor, that lets in the calcium, that activates the CAM kinase 2, that causes translocation of receptors to postsynaptic density and phosphorylation, that increases the conductance. And so now you start to get larger uh, EPSPs. Uh, that means that there's more depolarization on the synaptic input, and then the whole cycle repeats. And so you can actually have a kind of a switch here, a bistable switch um, in this very cartoonish example, a switch which involves everything from the molecules up to what the cell is doing. And you can imagine how this kind of a switch could scale up, uh, could become part of a, a yet bigger network. So this is the kind of thing that uh, we are very interested in. Okay, sorry. Uh, could you please hide the, the sharing uh, little panel at the bottom? People are asking. Oh, okay, I didn't realize what to do that. Sure, thank you. Okay, sorry. Okay, so, um, so anyway, so this is a, an example of a very simplified kind of multi-scale uh, modeling effort where the signaling, the chemical signaling, and the electrical signaling come together to yield uh, an interesting uh, kind of computation. Um, the way we define these models is using a system called R-Designer. This is a format, a very structured format uh, within Python. 
um, which allows us to play with everything from soma excitability, molecular transport, dendritic excitability, uh, adding spines, changing the shape of spines, you know, making them bigger as they, uh, as they are strengthened, modeling protein synthesis, turnover, synaptic input, and diffusion. So all of these things are possible things one can do um, in the context of our designer, and of course, uh, underlying it is Moose. Here's an example at the other end of the scale, a really monstrous example, which uh, I worked on a, a few years ago, and we continue to work on. Um, so what we were interested in here, although it's not the point of, the, of this uh, uh, workshop, we were interested in how uh, small segments of dendrite could use uh, reaction diffusion signaling to recognize sequential input, inputs which was organized in space and time. And as a proof of concept, so we showed this in a much more abstract form, but then we said, okay, let's put all of this system into uh, a real model, uh, a serious model. And this was a big model uh, taken from neuromorpho.org. It had over, over 5,000 spines. And in each spine, we had a set of reactions, some 20, 30 reactions and molecules. And in each segment of dendrite, we had a different set of reactions and molecules trying to represent what happened in biology. There's background synaptic input, pattern synaptic input in a few locations, and all of this did stuff. I mean, it was able in the end to recognize sequences, uh, which we could show uh, both at an abstract level and now in this very, very detailed model. Um, uh, here's an, uh, a, a, a quick movie from this, so you can sort of see that this is a, a, a complicated model with lots of spines and, and uh, electrical compartments. And if you look on the left panel, you'll see that there is a buildup of activity following sequential input. All of these segments have turned red. I hope the movie is coming through on Crowdcast. So you can see it's building up nicely uh, to give a strong response. If you look at the right panel over here, we'll zoom in again in a moment. Here, the input is not coming in a sequential manner. And as you can see, it dies down very, very soon. All right, so we'll run it through one more time. The input sort of jumps around. And as a result, you do not get a buildup of a strong response. So the point of this isn't to emphasize that uh, kind of a model. Uh, the, the science results were interesting on its own. The point is to say that uh, here we have a scope from going from a nice, small, compact, uh, multi-scale model to a really serious one. And uh, the nice thing is that to do this, you need to change roughly three lines in the R Designer framework. You change the cell morphology prototype, you refer to uh, a, a simple model or a complex uh, reconstruction. You specify a chemical system using something like SBML, some standard markup language, and you choose some ways to deliver the stimulus more focally because, of course, uh, your stimulus delivery has to change when you go from something like this to something like that. So this is the kind of thing that uh, Moose is uh, focused at, though it also spans, as I said, uh, the other levels of scale. So um, since this is a workshop on modeling tools, I thought it'd be nice to put in some numbers. Um, this little model over here, it has six, six uh, compartments, four ion channels, receptors, uh, because uh, diffusion is, has much short, shorter length constant than electrical propagation. It's got many more chemical voxels than it does uh, electrical uh, compartments. And this thing as a whole runs about five times faster than real time. Uh, this beast, on the other hand, uh, was much bigger, and it ran about 900 times slower than real time. This was without parallelization. One can parallelize the chemical uh, side of things very effectively, but it turns out that uh, it's actually the electrical computations that take the most time in a model of this scale. Okay, so the point I want to make here is that all of this is great fun and uh, is the bread and butter of what we do. But it's only a small part of the workflow of what we do as scientists trying to understand how the brain is doing its stuff. Um, so it's a small corner of the workflow. And this in, is what I think of as the overall workflow that we would like to do. We start out by thinking about what process we would like to understand. Then we do the uh, modeling and building up a model. In parallel, we get a lot of data and organize it, and I'll spend a fair amount of time explaining why that's particularly crucial in what we want to do. And then what we have uh, in this workflow is the capacity to optimize the model, to fine tune the parameters, uh, which is something that many of you do, 
Um, but this is now done in a nicely automated manner, which allows for very, very complicated models to be fit to very, very large data sets. Once one has optimized the model, then of course, it's uh, time to play with it. And I will give a brief glimpse about that in a moment. OK, so, um, so what I spoke about so far in the previous part of the talk was what Moose does. And now I'm going to the friends, the uh, pieces of code, the programs, the systems which do the other parts of this workflow. So let's consider a pathway model. So this thing is, uh, it looks moderately nasty, but actually it's much nastier than it looks because each of these, each of these uh, letters of the alphabet, each of these things here is actually a signaling pathway in its own right. So this thing has roughly 40 signaling pathways um, uh, which lead to, so basically they lead from synaptic input to post-translational uh, 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 activation of, uh, to translational activity, making more proteins, modifying the, the activity of the synapse uh, through all of these uh, pathways. So uh, just to give you an idea of what it's like, so those were the 40 pathways and we're zooming in on them. We're going to zoom in on just one of these pathways down over here, which itself has about seven, eight reactions of, uh, sorry, molecules, five reactions. And mind you, there's 40 of those. And that was one of the simplest one of them. There's a much more complicated one. You can sort of see it zooming in over there. So the point of this is to say that these are complicated reactions. Um, here, for example, is a much, much simpler model that I did some 20 odd years ago um, during my postdoc. And this itself is a pretty, pretty nasty system. And um, it's been very difficult to progress beyond uh, reaction systems of this size to what we're working on now. And I just thought it'd be kind of interesting to, you know, from the vantage point of many years working on it, why have we been stuck with uh, not being able to make models that are more complicated? The goal isn't complication. The goal is to account for essential biological processes. Why have we been stuck at relatively simplified versions? So it's not computer power. Uh, computer power has been growing marvelously uh, rapidly, thanks to um, everybody who likes to play computer games and other good things. Um, it's not simulator capabilities. We've had the capacity to do most of the things that I've shown you for at least a decade, uh, probably more. Um, experimental techniques now are shoveling uh, tons of data on us. In fact, I think we're in a data-rich environment rather than a model rich environment. We really need more uh, approaches to do the modeling. So this to me seems like a key set of reasons. First, it's very hard to do modeling by hand. Secondly, once you've made the models, it's very hard to derive them again. How do you go back and figure out what you did the first time? How do you convey this to somebody else who wants to do the same thing? Then the crosstalk that you have between the signaling pathways or different cell types or different regions of the brain, it limits how much you can compartmentalize it. Um, you tend to lose essential interactions if you just stick to one very small module or one very small level of computation in the brain. And finally, it's uh, boring and it's costly to get the kinds of data sets that one needs to make uh, good models. And that's in fact why some of the major brain projects in the world have been working uh, with this particular goal in mind. I should add that for all of these things to work, one needs to have a very, very effective system of model exchange and standardization, um, which uh, I think several uh, other people will be uh, highlighting in this workshop. So uh, let's just talk about the workflow, uh, picking a process. So what we were interested in, well, we're interested in several things, but uh, we focused, uh, what for today I'll talk about our interests in uh, autism, modeling the, the, uh, the autism syndrome uh, diseases. Um, so we have something called AutSim, which is what you just saw, that uh, signaling model where there's a gr group of people interested in this. And this is all under an overall project by the name of Sanket, uh, which happens to mean signaling, but it's also one of the nice backronyms that people like to make. Um, so uh, under, under this, we picked our process. Uh, we've been making a model, and now uh, let me tell you a little bit about getting the data. So the way we go about this, we're currently focusing primarily on the signaling pathways. And you almost certainly cannot see this uh, dense table, which is itself a very small fraction of 
some 200, nearly 300 uh, curated experiments from the literature that we put together to constrain each of those pathways. So um, this is coming on towards uh, six or seven experiments for every single pathway. It's not nearly enough. We would like to at least double it. But at least we have now all of the data sources that go into making a model of this kind. So we are uh, able to um, show the provenance, if you wish, of each of the models. Um, this is now organized on a, a platform we call FindSim Web. Um, it's the web interface to the FindSim project. And as I said, it, uh, one of its uh, things that it does is it hosts the database of the experiments that uh, we have codified. So um, we've got a whole bunch of experiments. We've got a lovely big model. Now let's see if we can make the model fit the experiments. And so to make this, of course, make this happen, we need the simulator, and that's what Moose does. We need FindSim, which helps to codify the experiment, run them on the model, and give a score for how well the experiment, uh, how well the model replicates that particular experiment. FindSim Web does the same from, a, from the web interface. And what we call HOS is the Hierarchical Optimization of System Simulations. Sorry about the backronym. Um, this is what actually does the hard work of optimization. And so uh, FindSim is the framework we've developed to do this, another acronym. And let me just show you how this works. So to do an optimization, to, make, to do this uh, kind of flow, uh, workflow, you need to have your model, of course, which you can define at this point, say, in SPML or NeuroML or any of the other standard formats. You need to know what, were the, what was the experiment. You need to know what the stimuli were given, uh, whether it was a time series experiment or a dose response or an LTP experiment. And you need to know what were the outcomes of the experiment. So um, these two things are combined in defining in the experimental database. So we know what the stimulus was, how to define the experiment, and you know what came out of the experiment. And this, of course, now runs it. And so we combine all of these things. And then that is fed to Moose. And it can do many things. It can make a standalone uh, experiment that uh, does all these things. Or it can simply run it uh, and compare the simulation readout with what the actual experiment uh, gave us, give us a score, and then we can go back and optimize the whole thing. So uh, it can handle many kinds of experiments. It can handle time series, where you give a stimulus and see a response. It can do dose response curves, which are much beloved of uh, biochemists and people who study signaling. It can do your standard bar chart, where you have different conditions and different levels of readouts. It can do a range of electrophysiological things, current clamp, voltage clamp, uh, EPSPs, LTP experiments, and so on. And it can do several other things, but this just gives you a flavor of the kinds of things that it, that, of the kinds of experiments that uh, we can handle in the system. Uh, here's an example of optimization. There's a bunch of parameters. There's a bunch of experiments which it is trying to simultaneously optimize for, and it tweedles all these parameters. It does so in a hierarchical manner. Uh, I won't go into the details of that. So we look at a small piece rather than the whole thing at the same time. And here's just an example of what you can get after fitting it. So it started out over here on the left panels. So this is not such a good match. That was the experiment. That was the simulation. But subsequently, it fit better. Uh, this one, it didn't manage to fit very well at all. This indicates perhaps that you want to uh, modify the model itself. This one, it fits beautifully. This one, it actually went backwards trying to improve the fit on some of these other things. And this is what happens when you do a multi-objective uh, optimization. Um, and hopefully very soon, uh, thanks to the Neuroscience Gateway and the INCF and uh, some very bright uh, students who worked in my lab and through Google Summer of Code, uh, we hope to be able to farm some of these optimization jobs out to NSG. Finally, uh, we can now aim to use the model. And as I indicated, uh, we are interested in looking at uh, auto the processes in autism. Um, for example, here's one kind of simulation that we've already begun to prototype. We use the fragile X mutation, uh, which is one of the major causes of uh, autism syndrome cases. And what we know from experiments is that in fragile X, certain molecules have their abundance altered quite significantly. Um, and so we can do this very, very straight in a straightforward way in the model. We can change the abundance of these various molecular species. 
and we can run them and compare what happens in the control model versus the fragile X model. And this is, you know, just uh, getting started. There's many, many things. For example, you want to now, of course, want to play with it and see what kinds of drug treatments could you do? What targets could you uh, go after in order to try to rescue some of these uh, deficits in the response? Here is another uh, kind of example. Um, supposing we have this uh, fragile X model, we made a nice model of this, and we want to ask what happens in a in a physiological context if you have all this complicated signaling going on. So uh, one approach is you take the reduced physiology, you take a very simplified model, you put in your signaling, and now you use these as building blocks, these simple things as building blocks of say a network model and ask how does the network function get altered if you have this impaired signaling. The other end of the scale might be you could put it into one of these really detailed models and ask what happens to single neuron phenotypes, to responses to treatment, what happens to plasticity, uh, synaptic plasticity, and so on. So these are the kinds of things that one can do with these, uh, with the, the detailed model, having optimized it, and now uh, playing with it. Just giving your so, quick 10 minute time check. Oh, I'm minutes. just about done here. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, so good. So I was, uh, uh, telling you all about Moose and friends. So Moose uh, runs multi-scale models and uh, it's been around for a while. So I spent only a little time on that. Um, our designer is a very concise Python way in which we can define very, very complicated models or very simple models and switch quite, quite easily between them. And both Moose and our designer rely very heavily on the existing rich ecosystem of uh, standards, SPML, NeuroML, uh, and various other standards. And we hope that we're helping to develop some other ones. Through FindSim, we've been developing some standards for defining experiments, um, as well as providing the framework for uh, running them. Through HOSS, we are able to systematically optimize these very, very, very complicated models. And I didn't go into much detail, but I, those of you who've tried to do this know that it is completely futile to try to optimize a model with uh, several thousand parameters by varying all of the parameters at once, which is why you need to do it in a hierarchical, very organized way. And that's what this uh, enables. There's also a lot of parallelism one can take advantage of. I haven't discussed Hiltau at all. It's a format that, we've, uh, that we're developing to uh, very rapidly uh, run uh, reduced uh, but accurate models of complicated signaling. And I think this can be very useful for multiple things. And then all of these uh, things are being used in our, uh, uh, in our platform, Sanket, where we're trying to pull together the models, the tools, uh, the databases uh, to uh, help to understand uh, problems of biological interest. Okay, so I will uh, wrap up with acknowledgements of some other kinds of friends, the human kinds. Uh, this is Harsha, Nisha, and Surbit. And these have been key people in uh, setting up these, uh, these uh, tools. And the database, Nisha in particular, has worked uh, incredibly diligently to put together the nearly 300 experiments and codify them and use them to optimize the model. We've had various people come through the lab at various times, uh, Jyoti Mangal, Vinod Ugale, uh, Hao Chen, and through the auspices of the Google Summer of Code, INCF, uh, the, the uh, Supercomputing Gateway, and others. I'd like to thank my collaborators, Aditi and Melanie, the other consortium members, and various funding sources. Um, thank you all very much. So, questions? I haven't seen any questions come in, but I do see some applause there in the chat. OK. Oh. Here's, there's one in the um, Q&A panel, if you want to open that. Okay. And Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Genghis. Salva, do you want to just unmute and ask your question? Sure. Yeah, so I had a question. Is this, I, I thought the, well, the talk was great, and I didn't really know about this fine team and fine team web. So can you say a bit more on whether 
uh, that tool is specific for Moose or generic for all simulators? So it's a generic tool. Um, I didn't emphasize it, but um, so Hiltau is a completely different simulator from Moose. And FindSim and FindSim Web and the optimizer, it works just as well with Hiltau as with Moose. Um, Hiltau is very fast, Moose, because it's not, it's a very, it's an abstract form of the simulation. So it's actually a very, very different looking simulation. And yet uh, the same, the key thing is the same experiments can be used for Hiltau as well as for Moose. So the, the codification, is, the, the standardization is not just at the level of FindSim being able to run with many simulators, it's that the whole uh, experimental database is also usable for very different kinds of models, for different, different scales of model detail. Thank you, that's great. I think that's a component that's missing generally, the step from converting from experiment to the model data. Uh, it's not, not easy to, to deal with. Thanks. And Salva, do you want to read out Alice's question as well that just came in? Sure. Uh, so she's asking which kind of optimization strategies are available in the tool? OK, so currently we're using very, very simple uh, things off the uh, Python minimization libraries. Um, again, it's, you know, all we do is we uh, pass the, the arguments to the optimizer. So in principle, one can use uh, any other optimizer if you so choose. Uh, we've been talking to Abrama Blackwell, who has uh, a nice uh, parallelized multi-parameter optimization system to try and use that. And we'd be very happy. It would be really nice to have better optimizers in this system because uh, it takes a very, very long time uh, if you're doing, uh, yeah, if you're doing these big models. Okay, great. And we have another question from David Beeman. Uh, can you say something about the current network modeling capabilities? Hi, Dave. Good to hear from you. Um, yeah, so Moose has, uh, since almost since its beginning, been able to do fairly uh, substantial network models. Um, one of the first big models that we did, in fact, was a model of the olfactory bulb, um, which I is uh, several many slides back, so I won't uh, I won't run back. But um, I think it had uh, very detailed uh, cell models and uh, several hundred. Uh, so I think it had a few dozen very detailed model uh, cell models of the mitral cells and very simple models of granule cells, and it had both. Uh, a regular synapses and dendrodendritic synapses and all the rest. So yeah, Moose does these things. Okay, great, thank you. Um, any other questions? I think we have one or two minutes left. So otherwise, maybe we can start setting up the next talk. I see a comment here in the chat saying impressive. So I agree. Right, a, thank you. Talk. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. So should I stop sharing or you'll take care of it? Um, um, uh, you've stopped sharing. I'm going to turn off your video now, Opi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. And our next speaker is Petra Ritter, and she's going to some echo there. And she's going to be talking about the virtual brain and virtual brain cloud. So whenever you're ready. So when Hello, everybody. Unfortunately, I can't echo. Yeah. I hope you... Petra, do you have um, any headphones you can put in? Yeah, let, let me try to get some. Get some. One second, please. one second, one second, one second. Okay. 
And just to remind, remind everyone, we have a Google Doc that's posted in the chat uh, where you can add any comments, uh, questions, or suggestions for the discussion sessions. OK. Really. Not yet. Um, I think uh, it would be helpful to turn down the sound on your computer and having microphone so that you're, you're not playing back in your own space would be helpful. Um, so if you have like headphones so only you can hear the audio from your computer, that may help. So it's not feeding back into your mic. Okay, is this? I can you hear me. Yes, we can hear you. So far, no echo. Okay, now I have to manage to turn that on again. Great, and now you can share your. So, funny thing is that I have my echo now in my. In my now clear my screen. It's a little bit difficult because I hear my own voice now with a delay of a second or so in my ear. Oh, sorry. Um, you are breaking up a bit, so I wonder if you want to keep video off just to limit bandwidth. Especially while screen sharing. See my screen? Not seeing the screen yet. No. And Robert is suggesting yep, there you, it could, is. you could Go just ahead. turn off your speakers entirely, and maybe that helps. Okay, so I have to turn you a little bit louder to hear you, um, but then. I Tell me in just because because then I can speak better without my echo. Okay, Petra. Well, we do see your slides, so that's great. Um, at least for me, you are breaking up a little bit occasionally, so I think turning off your video may help with bandwidth issues and just just going audio only while you present. Okay, so I turned off my I So are you seeing my screen and can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Petra, we can hear you and we see your um, first slide. It's not in presentation view, but we can see it. If you want to start presenting, see how it goes. Oh, 
Okay, wonderful. Then I stop. And welcome to the presentation about the virtual brain and the virtual brain cloud. So the virtual brain is a brain that has been developed several years ago, of course, and it went public for the first time in 2012. And you can find it under the URL, thevirtualbrain.org. than 28,000 downloads, as you can see here. So the idea behind the virtual brain is to construct brain network models using individual structural connectomes that we can infer from imaging data. So we have the individual structural connectome, we have uh, the individual cortical geometry, and we construct these brain network models for each node or brain region we have and also to change the dynamics in the brain and then you simulate for each what the neuron um, this can be two potentials forward models we then translate those neuronal activities into um, for example functional magnetic Petra, I think um, we're experiencing some bandwidth issues. We're no longer so the able to see your screen. Individualized um, simulations, and uh, we also provide. Petra, Petra, the we cannot see your screen. Face um, along this um, a Python uh, interface. Petra, can you hear us? We cannot. So I just see the screen. We cannot see your screen anymore, and the sound is not so good. I think we're experiencing some some bandwidth issues. I wonder. Not um, not so good. <laughs> what is? I wonder if maybe we should switch. Go to the next speaker, and Petra, if you could um, uh, like restart and try. Okay, so and I, we'll try I don't again. Can repeat it. I was going to say maybe we should go to the next speaker for now, and Petra, you could restart your computer. Uh, and since I do not hear anything, and since I'm in presentation mode, I also do not see any messages at the moment. I just will continue. So here you see the graphical user interface. Okay. Um, so you see the simulator interface. You see how we can. Petra. Analyze the dynamics Petra, of a model so you can select different we um, hear, population. We cannot see your screen. Yes. We cannot see your screen, so we're gonna go on to the next speaker and maybe you can try to solve these uh, issues reconnecting. Can you hear us? Oh, okay. So yeah, the sound is intermittent and uh, we cannot see your screen. So sorry, I thought you were seeing it for the entire time. We didn't see it at all? We only saw the first slide, unfortunately. Really sorry that you're having these issues. Hopefully we okay. can uh, solve them and get back to you on in half an hour. Okay, sure. Can we in the background try to solve this? Because yesterday it seemed to work when we had the test. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Petra, if you could Email me at events at oh, alleninstitute.org. Yeah. Maybe we can okay, find a way. Uh, try to reconnect. Uh, right now, I'm going to um, put you off screen, and I'm going to bring up Ben, our next speaker, and we'll get keep try to keep things moving. Hello, can you can you all hear me and see me? Yes. Good for now, yeah. Okay, great. Well, then I will try to uh, share my screen. Ah, now. And being 
informed that uh, Firefox, the same uh, Now I'm having the same problem we had in the test session that I'm not getting permission to um, to share my screen from Firefox, which is very annoying because we actually configured this to work. Um, oh, this is going well. Yeah, well, we, we configured this to actually work correctly and I, I set it all up during the practice session the other day. Okay, so. If your slides are available somewhere easily accessible, I can potentially share for you and click for you. Okay, um, would, should I send that to? Um, Events at alleninstitute.org. Okay, the Allen Institute, all one word? Yes. Okay, one moment, I'll, I'll send that to you. That's, um, I'm really sorry, I mean, we, we set this up <laughs> last week. So one moment, I've just got to navigate my computer to um, find them. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> of course, Apple doesn't want you to see certain things in certain places. Okay, I have uh, sent them. So I have not, I'm looking at the permissions on my Firefox and it's telling me explicitly that cloud, this has full permission, Crowdcast has full permission. So I do not know what's gone wrong here. So do you, do you, did you receive the slides? I have received them. I'm trying to share now, one second. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, after that slight delay, so good afternoon or good morning, depending where you're joining us from today. So I'd like to say I thank you for the opportunity to present amongst all these really, really interesting talks. I think we got off to a, the first talk on Moose was very interesting. Um, so my name is Ben Cumming. Um, I'm going to be presenting the work of a really talented team of people in uh, Germany and uh, Switzerland who've been working been developing this tool called Arbor as part of the Human Brain Project over the last uh, five years, which is a simulation tool for uh, networks of uh, multi-compartment cells. So uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to start with an obs observation that there are many ambitious uh, simulation aims that are limited by the amount of computational resources that are available. For example, people who might, may want to run, you know, very large models with many cells, very large networks with our very detailed cells. And there's a clear trend over the last uh, 10 years towards, you know, replacing multi-core CPU architectures in the fastest HPC systems with um, newer architectures like uh, GPUs or many core CPUs. And these are going to constitute, you know, the vast majority of the largest HPC systems that are going to be installed over the next um, over the next three years in Europe and the US, and we face a challenge ensuring that all of our simulation tools can run on these systems. And I, I hope to convince you today that this will also require that we have our portable model descriptions as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
So Arbor is a library for the simulation of um, morphologically detailed cells in on simulations of morphologically detailed cells in large networks on HPC systems. And it's got two kind of our key aims. The first aim is to enable efficient scalable simulation on all of the HPC systems now, specifically those ones available in the Human Brain Project, and those which are going to become available in the near to medium term future. And the second aim is to provide an interface for inputting diverse model descriptions, because a fast simulation tool isn't very useful if you can't run all the different types of models people want to run on it. Um, all of the features that we have implemented are implemented on all of the target architectures, including different GPU and vectorized CPU processors. And I would love to talk all day about, you know, about the first aim above, about exactly how we went about implementing all of these algorithms on the different uh, processes and then scaling them over distributed systems. Um, but instead, I'm going to talk about the second aim, which I think is a very important one, which is focusing on, which is about how Arbor facilitates our model portability um, based on some observations from porting models to run in Arbor. So the next slide, please. Uh, so I like to use this um, yeah, classic um, illustration of a Purkinje cell to illustrate the challenges of developing a simulation tool like Arbor or Neuron or Nest or Moose. And that is that you know, different users require a simulation tool that can efficiently simulate the many different ways that they might want to represent this cell from you know, a simple uh, leaky integrate and fire point neuron all the you know, various levels of detail up to you know a detailed description of every last you know dendrite and branch in the uh, in the tree with spatial variation between ion channel distributions and stochastic you know synapses, and likewise for modeling networks, users want to have that same level of flexibility in describing network dynamics, uh, gap junctions, and which variables to variables and statistics they might want to record for later analysis and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. So the, a key realization from our work on Arbor was that you know, whilst developing efficient hardware optimized implementations of each of the um, you know, modeling features that we've implemented is difficult, it, it's also very challenging to develop an interface that facilitate, facilitates you know, flexible description of you know, generic models that can then be somehow translated to run on all of these different hardware hardware backends. And in fact, that can be the most time consuming part to get right. Uh, next slide, please. So a uh, big challenge when trying to accommodate you know, such rich model descriptions is what I call um, portability. And I want to define what I mean by portability because, you know, people might have different definitions. And I think portability has two main aspects. I mean, the first is uh, performance portability, which means that the tools and the software we have can run efficiently and scale on the different computer architectures, maybe starting with um, you know, your laptop all the way up to um, you know, different uh, HPC clusters. And also that it can be adapted it's well enough engineered that it could be adapted to support new hardware architectures as they become available. Um, the second aspect of portability is model portability, which means model descriptions that are simulator and architecture agnostic. This means they don't have any details that are in them that are specific to, a, you know, related to a specific simulator or a specific uh, computational you know, computer architecture you want to run the model on. And that the, mod the model representations are what I call flat. And a flat representation really is uh, the what, not the how. So it should be a very explicit description of the model, of the cells, of the connections, of the various parts. And it should be something that can be translated. So it can be taken from this, whatever this flat description is, can be easily translated into something that will run inside your different um, simulation uh, simulation tools shouldn't require a layer of interpretation. So next slide, please. So these two, you know, portability concerns aren't orthogonal. They're, re they're related and you can't have one without the other. 
and they really require a sep and from the perspective of someone who's developing a simulation tool, they require a separation of concerns between model descriptions, which we might download from the uh, from the internet, and how they're actually implemented in a specific simulation tool. And two ways that I'm going to focus on today that you know sim from a simulation tool writer's perspective, simulation tools can support portable descriptions is by uh, separating hardware and, implement and implementation details from model descriptions in the interface. And the second is using flat model descriptions in the simulator's interface. And I'm now going to cover, for, the, for most of this talk, spend that time covering two, two illustrations of this using Arbus interface. So our next slide, please. So first topic is you know, separating the model from the implementation inside the actual internal um, simulator interface. So next slide, please. So, you know, the interface used by Arbor to input or represent model descriptions is called a recipe. And a recipe implements an interface that can be queried using a cell's identifier for information like the uh, description of a cell, its morphology, its um, regions and locations on that morphology, its ion channels, synapses, all of these properties, as well as network connections coming in that terminate on the cell and their at synapses, which we call spike targets, and all of the other you know, information required to build a model. And this is a very uh, cell-centric um, interface. So recipes provide a formal representation of how many workflows in a kind of an ad hoc manner interact with simulation tools um, to build models today. And a key feature of a recipe is that it really describes only the model the cells, the connections, and the biological processes. It has no information about how this model should actually be run or implemented on a specific, you know, in a specific uh, hardware architecture. So uh, next uh, slide, please. So we'll just walk through a best way to illustrate then how we take a recipe and run it on some hardware is just to walk through our Python interface. And the first step that we do is we define a hardware context so a hardware context is completely independent from the actual recipe or model description. Here, and when you create a hardware context, you always have to define a number of threads, CPU threads that will be used in a thread pool. Then optionally, if uh, GPU support is enabled and you need, want to use GPUs for this model, you can provide a GPU to be used. And also optionally, you can provide an MPI communicator. Just because these features are, have been added to, have been compiled into Arbor doesn't mean they have to be used on a specific model run. So this is separate from the recipe description. We have a recipe and a hardware context. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next step is what we call domain decomposition. So we have a recipe which is composed of um, cells and connections and all the other information. And we want, we ne and we have a description of the hardware. And we need to basically distribute this computational work over the resources, over these computational resources. So a we call this process domain decomposition, and we assign a cell to each MPI rank. We assign cells to each MPI rank, and then on each rank, depending on what hardware resources are available, we group these cells onto different uh, CPU thread pools and GPU resources. Um, and of course, many users actually know better than we, we do how they want to distribute their work. So we provide the option for users to manually specify exactly where, where their model should run. So uh, next uh, slide, please. So finally, we have this uh, the fourth step, which is to actually instantiate the model into what we call a simulation. So we take our pure model description, the hardware context, and a recipe that, and a um, you know domain decomposition that um, describes how to distribute the model, and we create a simulation object which actually contains. This is the point where we actually build the model with all the data structures specific to the um, target architectures that we're going to be running on. And this also provides a generic interface then for steering the simulation and then for sampling information like our spikes and voltage traces, currents, and all these sorts of interesting things we want to get out of models. And it has no global state, so we can create as many of these simultaneously as we want. They're very cheap to uh, build up and tear down. So the, all of this might look uh, fairly logical, but it was part of a very deliberate process to completely separate model descriptions from how we actually implement things inside Arbor, with the, the aim being that we should, should make it much easier to import 
and bring models into Arbor. So the next um, the next example of you know how to as a simulator can you know encourage these sorts of uh, portable model descriptions is by using flat descriptions in its API. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, the main portability challenge that we've found whilst working on Arbor has been constructing, you know, single cell models from descriptions that have been developed for the most widely used simulation tool in the field, Neuron. Um, and single cell models are really the fundamental um, building block of these large multi-compartment network simulations. And they're also where the vast majority of your computation usually occurs. Now, models developed for Neuron have two, I already described using two main components. The first is descriptions of ion channel and uh, synapse dynamics in a domain specific language called NModel, which is designed specifically for this task. Um, Arbor has an internal compiler for NModel descriptions so that they can be used with uh, minimal modifications. So this part isn't, um, isn't a big problem for us. The second requirement is a description of a model's geometry, you know, the morphology of a cell, as well as definitions of locations and regions on the morphology to which dynamics described you know, in, in NModel are applied. And for the second task, Turing complete languages like Python are really attractive because they give users the power and flexibility of a full programming language to walk the morphology, create regions and locations. Um, the problem is that these descriptions always end up utilizing simulator specific interfaces and are next to impossible to pass automatically to generate input for a different simulator. So the process of actually porting these models often ends up being a very manual and a time consuming process that a, a PhD student or an Arbor developer has to do instead of doing much more um, interesting work. So our next slide, please. So we'll have a look at how Arbor um, yeah, represents uh, morphologies that uh, implements this workflow to facilitate our flat descriptions. So cells in Arbor are composed of a tree of what we call cable segments. So this will be a, a very similar approach that people, have, uh, that users of other tools like, uh, like Neuron or Moose will be familiar with. Now, our cells are composed entirely of these uh, truncated conic frustrums. So they're not cylinders. You can have a different radius at each end. And after supporting the idea of a spherical segment at the soma for many years, we finally removed it when we realized they weren't really possible to consistently use in model descriptions. Um, and this has been designed whilst looking at NeuroML, SWC, and NeuroLicitor formats that we can represent Basically, we can represent those um, those formats inside our representation of a tree. And I've got a little note here that um, please don't use spherical somas in SWC files. It doesn't make any sense, and it causes uh, simulator developers like uh, like us a lot of a lot of pain. So, next slide, please. Um, the next step we have to do once we have a, this description of the morphology is to define regions and locations. And we do this using a thing called lock sets and regions. So a lock set is a multi-set of locations on a morphology. It might be a single point like the center of the soma. It might be a set of points like the locations of inhibitory synapses or the tips of the, you know, the end points of a dendritic arbor. Um, a region is a subset of a morphology's uh, cable segments or its surface. So examples of that might be the surface of the soma or the entire dendritic tree or everywhere on the cell that is more distant than 100 uh, micrometers from the soma, or the dendrites with radius less than one micrometer. You, you, when you've seen enough models, you realize that people have uh, endless different uh, regions and lock sets that they want to work with. So ARPA provides a domain specific language for their distinct, succinct uh, description. So next slide, please. So this domain specific language uses X, S expressions and is composable. And the key feature of this um, domain specific language is that it, is, it doesn't have any features other than those required to describe uh, morphological features. So this, um, this example here, we don't need to go into too much detail, but this will let us pick out subtrees of the morphology with uh, certain properties to which we might want to apply special, um, you know, specific ion channel or electrical properties. We then take all of these um, 
simple expressions and we build them into a to a dictionary we give them labels which we then which can be used uh, later on and this replaces and simplifies non-portable and bug prone hoc templates so this amounts it this replaces you can replace in a few lines of uh of our domain specific language hundreds of lines of a hoc template or python template so the next uh, slide please so here's just some examples of how to create a, a, a type of region or a, um, a lock set. So on the left, we have a, an expression that takes all of the terminal points. Terminal points are the points at the end of, you know, your, um, the tips of the, uh, of the tree. And then it restricts them to the dendritic arbor, which has tag three from an SWC um, identifier. So this will end up with uh, the end points, the tips of the dendritic arbor. Um, and on the right, we have a region, which is the all, re all parts of the cell, all cable sections of the cell that have a radius less than 0 0.5 micrometers. So you can see how you can, you can build up some quite complicated regions from simple expressions. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, we can take our morphology description and build a what we call a cable cell by adding a by adding combining it with one of these uh, sets of uh, of uh, of labels these dictionary labels and then we can refer to these to assign properties so here we've created a cell and then we're adding on the soma we're adding Hodgson Huxley um, dynamics and on the uh, dendrite and axon regions we're adding a passive uh, passive you know, leaky current and then we're going to place some exponential synapses on the um, inhibitory um, on our inhibitory our synapse sites and then we can also place things like spike detectors and uh, current clamps and other features like this so next cell so what we've what this interface does is it reduces the problem the challenge of describing a cell into requiring three separate flat bits of information to define a single cell a morphology description, for example, from an SWC file, a dictionary that provides labels for regions and lock sets that we want to use, and then a mapping of mechanisms and their properties to these regions and uh, lock sets. Um, and an important point here is that things like compartmentalization, which is a, a back-end detail specific to how we solve the uh, problem numerically, are not exposed at all through our, um, through our interface through through this interface we've really separate things out again all of this might seem fairly simple and logical but it was the result of a careful design process to make sure that um, we we don't make models that come into arbor really depend on arbor's features so next uh slide please um and a final little uh i want to end this uh talk with an example of using arbor's interface to load to support our cells from the allen sdk uh, next slide, please. So as I'm sure the um, majority of people here are aware, you know, the Allen Institute provides via its, um, this Allen SDK, so programmatic access to a wide range of open data sets. So you can install the SDK and then open up your you know, Python interpreter and uh, start downloading all sorts of different uh, data sets and uh, models. Um, we're interested in single cell models, one of these data sets, which are models of single cells that have been developed by um, developed at the Allen Institute, and when you download one of these models, you get three important bits of uh, separate bits of information for building the model. The first is the morphology, the geometry of the cell as an SWC file. The second is a JSON file which has the uh, mechanism and electrical properties, ion channels, and so on forth, and where they are to be placed on regions, as well as our uh, fitted parameters. And the third is some electrophysiological uh, measurements from the lab, which were used to um, optimize or tune these uh, fitted parameters. And the aim of the exercise was to get a new developer on Arbor, who'd only been working on Arbor for about a month, I think, to see if they could write a wrapper for Arbor that took Allen SDK descriptions and runs them and then validates them against the, uh, the known good results in Neuron. So next slide, please. So the experience of the developer was the usual experience, which is that the first 90% was easy. It took about two days. 
that was the step of you know installing the SDK, a neuron and arbor, and then updating the end model, you know, these ion channel descriptions from the Allen um, Institute so that they would work with Arbor. And then half a day to get the model up and running in each simulator and producing uh, at least physically uh, realistic um, results. The last 10%, as is usually the case, was actually was then spent, then took about a week. And that was the step of getting the results generated from Arbor to closely match those from neuron or from the electrophysiological uh, data sets. And the reasons for this, there were a few reasons. One was that the Allen SDK modifies ax axon geometry in a couple of places, a couple of different locations after loading the cell. So this is an example of where a, a flat description might ensure that the SWC file actually had the final, uh, that goes into the model description actually has the final um, cell shape that we want to work with. Um, neuron also, by default, like Arbor, sets of certain properties like ion reversal, ion species, you know, reversal potentials to be constants, but neuron will automatically enable using the Nernst equation under certain uh, circumstances. And this is what was happening in this model. So we had to determine that this was happening. And again, this is the sort of feature, the information that could probably go into the uh, JSON description saying, hey, we are going to use the Nernst equation. Um, and finally, the JSON inputs aren't fully uniform across all models. So there's a bit of variation between how they're um, laid out. We could probably use some sort of a schema for them. And also, I'm going to mention again that spherical somas in SWC files are a little bit magic. And they, that did require a bit of a hacking to, to get that to work, uh, work really well. So next slide. But in the end, after about a week of work, we're able to reproduce the results. So here we've got one of the uh, voltage traces. And you can not you can only see one line there. There's a dotted line for the Allen Institute, which is for, with, for what we call the Allen results, which are the results calculated using the SDK and, uh, and neuron. So we see we get a very good match between the, uh, between the two simulators using a neuron installed via PIP and Arbor from the, from the masters. Um, and this was done on a, a MacBook. And you can see that um, Arbor is uh, delivering on its promise of being uh, significantly faster than, than Neuron here. So next slide, please. So the final observation from our work on the Allen SDK is that the SDK you know, single cell model descriptions do a good job of separating model description from the simulation tool. It isn't perfect, but the issues were all very small and simple ones to address. Um, and they're the sorts of issues that you would expect to arise if a model description format has grown up hand in hand with a specific uh, simulator. So there are no significant barriers there to really using Arbor in the Allen SDK. Uh, so next slide, please. So I um, just want to finish this by saying that Arbor is under active open development. We've now got um, you know, six people working on it in the Human Brain Project for the next three year phase called SGA3. It's available on GitHub and version 0.4 with full support for the Allen SDK mechanisms and morphology descriptions is going to be released very soon. That support is currently in the master branch. Next slide, please. I just want to acknowledge our, um, the fund that our funding for this has come entirely from the Human Brain Project and in-kind contributions from a Ulich Forschung Centrum and the uh, Swiss uh, National Supercomputing Center. So um, that finishes my um, presentation. So I will now see if anyone has any questions. Or give, given that we've had such uh, delays, if anyone doesn't have any immediate um, questions, you can yeah. just uh, you can type them type them into the chat, and I'll just respond via text. Might be the best way to do this. Exactly what I was going to say, Ben. Okay, great. There's a few in there for you. So I'm going to take you off screen then and bring up Petra so we can try to catch up. Does that sound right, Selma? Um, yeah, maybe we can just have a couple minutes of questions. I think it's quite a fascinating talk for me and quite a few interesting questions. So maybe if you don't mind answering a couple now. Because we okay. have half an hour afterwards for that we have for a break, coffee, coffee break. So we can go a bit into that. And I think this would be of interest. 
Okay, so I've got, um, okay, it looks like the most um, popular question here is, have you tried exporting, this is from, from Robert, uh, have you tried exporting channel distributions into a declarative format to NeuroML from uh, Neuron? If so, what difficulties did you run into? Uh, we, we haven't tried that. Um, we're currently writing a um, NeuroML um, parser that will import uh, NeuroML models. Um, I don't know, I don't know, are you saying that it's possible to take an N model description and then put it into, convert that into NeuroML from, from Neuron? Um, if that's the case, I wasn't aware that you could do that. Um, so I've got someone here, Joe, who said, I've worked with morphologies and dealing with somas was always a pain. Some come spherical, some as series of cylinders, etc. How would you recommend defining a soma? Um, the big problem with uh, defining somas and spheres and that sort of thing is that everywhere in our models we think in terms of cables. So when we talk about locations, we always say this distance along a cable, the beginning of the cable, the end of the cable. This representation doesn't, this sort of way of referring to locations doesn't make any sense on a sphere because a sphere is fundamentally a, you can think of it as a zero dimensional object, whereas cables are one dimensional. Um, so defining a soma as a cylinder or as a series of cylinders, or you know, trunk, you know, tapered um, cylinders is the way to is the way to go. Um, that's then compatible with um, the way you describe the rest of the cell. So yeah, neurolicitor style contour stacks is a good way to to start. Um, could I elaborate a bit on what a recipe contains? I suppose it, recipes don't really contain anything, they provide an interface that you implement. So um, you can ask for the number of cells in the model, and then for a specific cell, you can get the type of that cell, whether it's a simple point neuron or a multi-compartment uh, cell, what we call a cable cell, then you can get that the actual detailed description of that. Then you can also uh, get information such as locations where we're going to want to sample variables sample um, you know, things like voltages and currents, and you can then build also information about uh, how gap junctions are to be constructed and how networks are to be, um, you know, network connections are to be defined. Um, the idea behind this is that you can, if you do things well, you can do it in a very lazy fashion where you only generate that information when it's required. So this makes parallel model building like orders of magnitude faster, makes it a, a much faster process. Um, okay. But um, we've got some documentation for that. Um, ben, why not on Neurostars? Um, I don't know what Neurostars is. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if someone wants to update that. <laughs> okay, I think we can yeah, finish off. Thanks so much, Ben, for a great talk. Okay. And uh, we'll move, we'll try to get Petra back. Okay, hello everybody. <laughs> Second trial. I will share my screen again and I think um, at least I have no echo anymore. I hope you can hear me. We hear uh, you perfectly. Can you see my screen? Yes. Petra, maybe you can maximize or hide the side where it says light layout so we can see the slides a bit bigger. Yeah, if you click play the keynote. Okay, wonderful. So I go now in full screen mode. Um, please give me a sound sign if you cannot see or hear me because now I do not see the chat window anymore. Thank you for the second opportunity to present uh, today to you the virtual brain and the virtual brain cloud. The virtual brain is a full brain simulation software that has been released as open source software in 2012. And since then had more than 28,000 downloads. You can find the software um, via the URL, thevirtualbrain.org. 
And the main idea is to use structural connectivity, structural connectomes that you can derive from brain imaging data to construct individualized brain network models. You also take into account the geometry of the brain and each region is represented by a neuronal mass, a mean field model, um, and they are interacting through the structural connectome. You can apply a stimulation to mimic a brain stimulation and each region then is um, simulating neuronal activity that is translated into EEG activity, functional magnetic resonance imaging activity, or MEG activity. The virtual brain software has a script interface, a Python interface, and also a very nice graphical user interface that you can see here, which makes it very easy and intuitive to get started with the virtual brain software. So here you see, for example, the simulator interface, where you can uh, visualize uh, the brain in 3D, you can also analyze the dynamics of certain models. You have a repertoire of neuronal mass models that you can select from and include in the brain network model. So the, the unique um, uh, aspect of the virtual brain is that it bridges computational neuroscience with uh, brain imaging. And with this, it allows us to uh, run personalized brain simulations. I will just show you how we use magnetic resonance imaging of Jessica to construct such an individualized brain network model. So we take into account the different layers, including the cortical um, uh, surface, we reconstruct the nerve fibers, and we parcelate the brain in different regions according to either anatomical landmarks or features like functional connectivity. And uh, then we construct our brain network model and run a simulation. And this is what you see here. This is a, a simulation of 22 minutes of resting state activity, fMRI activity of Jessica's brain. And um, to the right, you see the underlying equations. In this case, we have the reduced Wong Wang model. So you see here uh, two populations, so the excitatory and inhibitory mean field. And uh, the first two equations represent the input currents that drive um, the excitatory and the inhibitory population. Those are then translated into firing rates, R, again for the excitatory and inhibitory population, and uh, those translate into synaptic activity for both populations. And with this, we get for each brain region the neuronal underlying activity that gives rise to the large scale observations of 22 minutes of resting state fMRI activity. And we can pick one region and uh, visualize or analyze the underlying neuronal activity. So, for example, here you see the firing rates of the excitatory and inhibitory mean fields from this um, single region. So here you see the approach. We have the individual brain network model based on the individual structural connectome. Each region is represented by a mean field or population node. In this case, it's the reduced one, one model with excitatory and inhibitory populations. They're generating firing rates that are translated into synaptic activity that are translated into functional magnetic resonance imaging time series. And those are then compared to empirical functional magnetic resonance imaging time series of the corresponding um, brain regions. And with this, we optimize uh, the selected three parameters in the study that I'm showing you here. These were three free parameters. And there was one particular aspect in the study. We injected EG source activity instead of noise in each um, brain region to mimic the excitatory postsynaptic currents. And here we see now that a single brain model with a fixed parameter set can capture the observations, the features of empirical data across several time and spatial scales. So on the upper panel, you see now our analyzed uh, simulation results. Uh, ranging from 100 millisecond uh, time windows up to 20 minutes time windows. And in the bottom panel, you see the corresponding empirical data. So we see here, for example, in panel A, the relation as simulated by our model 
between the firing rates and the membrane potential phase. This is a single alpha wave that lasts 100 milliseconds. And so there's a certain relationship between firing rates and the phase of alpha oscillations. This has been measured invasively in monkeys, as you can see here, and our model captures this relationship. Please remember, it was optimized um, based on the region-wise aggregated average fMRI time series. But all the other features of underlying neuronal interactions were just emerging phenomena from um, our model. So here in panel B, you see the relationship between inhibitory postsynaptic currents and excitatory postsynaptic currents as obtained from our simulation. And below you see the same measures as obtained empirically in rats with invasive recordings. And we see that the ratio between inhibitory postsynaptic currents and excitatory postsynaptic currents is similar in the similar range. Then we go to panel C, where we see the relationship between firing rates and the power of the local field potential alpha rosin. And we see that with increasing alpha power, we have lower firing rates. We find the same in invasive monkey recordings. So now we go to panel D. And we see the relationship between the EG signal in our simulations and the fMRI, the gold signal in our simulations, and can compare this again to empirical data. And there are several publications that show an inverse relationship between the alpha oscillations, uh, um, 10 hertz EG oscillations, um, and the gold signal. And this is what we also find in our simulations. We also find in our simulations uh, scale invariance um, or um, power law scaling in the resting state fMRI data, which are also being found in empirical fMRI resting state data. And finally, we see here the functional connectivity and its switching, the switching correlation structure in the brain over time, functional connectivity dynamics, that has been in a similar way found in empirical studies. So with this, I just want to show you that with a single brain network model, it is possible to capture with a single fixed parameter set many um, different processes at different spatial and temporal scales in the brain. And we can link them together mechanistically. So here in the lower panel, these are all independent observations. In the upper panel, this is the result of a um, a comprehensive, self-consistent brain network model. And we see if we manipulate one relationship, for example, the ratio between inhibition and excitation, or the ratio or relationship between the firing rate and the phase of the membrane potential oscillations, how that would impact and cascade up or down to the other um, spatial and temporal domains. So this is how we turn these observations into real understanding of the mechanisms behind. Here I want to show you how we link um, molecular pathways to large-scale brain dynamics. So uh, amyloid um, beta is a protein that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease and studies with animals, with mice and with cellular cultures have shown that in the vicinity of these proteins that accumulate in the brain, the function of inhibitory interneurons is impaired. And this leads to a disinhibition of the excitatory pyramidal uh, neurons and to hyperexcitation. So we can now obtain the um, regional distribution of beta amyloid from PET data, positron emission tomography data. And this is exactly what you see here, the distribution of beta amyloid as measured with positron emission tomography. So now we can map the burden of beta amyloid on each regional model, the population models here. And here I show you one um, neural mass model as it is um, available for selection in the virtual brain. So this is the Janssen RIT model that consists of an inhibitory interneuron, a pyramidal cell, and an excitatory interneuron. We now can map the PET information, so the um, information about the beta amyloid burden in the brain on the connectivity parameters of these different populations of the mass model. So we modulate the coupling of the inhibitory interneuron to the pyramidal cell by the amount of the beta amyloid as provided with positron emission tomography data. And this is now the analysis. This is a state space analysis. We see a bifurcation diagram. 
You see here the activity of the pyramidal cells of one selected population, and here at the x-axis the activity of the inhibitory population. And here at the z-axis we see the network input, so the population is embedded in the brain network. And depending on the activity of the embedding network, we see that the dynamics, the dynamical repertoire of the pyramidal cells and the inhibitory interneurons varies along this axis. So we have here a large limit cycle that would lead to oscillatory activity. We have here a smaller limit cycle that would lead to faster oscillatory activity. And here, if you follow the flow fields as indicated here um, with the arrows and the spirals, you end up at a line, at a fixed point. So here we would have no oscillatory activity. And this depends on where exactly we are with respect to the network input. So the network input in which the populations are embedded uh, modulates uh, the dynamical repertoire of the population. And now it's getting even more complex because we have the information about the beta amyloid from the PET data that we can include in our models that modulate the coupling between the local inhibitory interneurons and the pyramidal cells. And this coupling is expressed here as a parameter J, and you will see over time this will be varied. And with each variation of J, we see that the dynamic repertoire of the population of the pyramidal cells and the inhibitory interneurons in this region also changes. So we see that this Changing J, we get a larger limit cycle, for example, that leads to a slowing and the resulting activity of the pyramidal cells, as you can see here. So the resulting temporal trajectories um, of the pyramidal cell activity, we see a slowing of the oscillatory activity. And this is what translates into our simulated EG. And this is exactly what we find in patients with um, neurodegenerative disease and in particular with Alzheimer's disease. So we can, with this approach, link the observations from our PET measurements, positron emission tomography, that gives us a beta amyloid distribution in the brain, to the EG observations that come from the electroencephalogram via a mechanistic um, pathway. Here you see um, the main, the predominant oscillatory activity in the simulated um, EG of three groups of uh, patients, Alzheimer's disease patients, mild cognitive impairment patients, and healthy controls. And you see by just including the beta amyloid, the protein burden, um, the Alzheimer's disease patients show a slowing, they show a dominant slow oscillation in their simulated EG. There's a peak at 4 Hz, which is a theta band, which is not a physiological rhythm. So typically the alpha rhythm is dominant in the EG, but here in the Alzheimer's disease patients, in the simulated activity, we see a dominant theta activity. And this is exactly what we also find in the patients. And with our modeling approach, by including the PET data, we get a mechanistic um, uh, hypothesis how the protein distribution in the brain is linked to the electrophysiological activity that we see in the EG. We can go one step further and simulate the effect of drugs in the brain. We here picked memantine, which is an NMDA antagonist, and we model the effect of the NMDA antagonist by blocking the activity or the connectivity between the excitatory interneurons and the pyramidal cells. And here you see again our three groups, the Alzheimer's disease group, the mild cognitive impairment group, and the healthy control group. You see here on the y-axis the dominant um, frequencies that are output by our simulations. We see the slowing for the Alzheimer's disease group, and if we apply virtual memantine, you see that the activity in the Alzheimer group is normalized and reaches the same level as we find in the healthy control group and the mild cognitive impairment group. So in this way, it is possible by using the virtual brain to simulate drug effects. Here it is still on a group level, but in the future we hope to be able to do this on an individual patient or subject level. 
we cannot only simulate dynamics, but we can also simulate a cognitive function with the virtual brain. And I want to quickly show you an example here. We can plug in functional circuits in the brain network model. So this is a functional circuit that is able to generate decision-making and working memory. And we plug this circuit consisting of four excitatory populations that are mutually self-inhibiting in the prefrontal cortex and in the posterior parietal cortex. And uh, the um, decision-making experiment that we simulate here is inspired by a random dot motion experiment where the subjects have to decide in which direction the majority of these dots is moving. In our case, the two populations have to decide this. And interestingly, the artificial circuits perform differently well in different virtual brains. So if the virtual brain comes from a person that scores high in fluid and intelligence test, the decision making is better, as you can see here. So those virtual brains of higher scoring people achieve more correct decisions. We can now use the virtual brain modeling approach um, to understand what are the underlying mechanisms uh, to those observations. So what you see here is again the face portraits for four different scenarios four different degrees of functional connectivity or correlation as indicated here by R in our embedding network. And uh, the face portraits are spent by the activity of uh, the population E and the population B that are competing. The gray thin lines here represent 1,000 simulations for each scenario. And the orange lines are the average activities, average trajectories, average according to the decision, either for population A or population B. As long as the trajectories, the orange trajectories are um, in the vicinity of this red diagonal, they are in a balanced state. So the activity of population A and B are similar. And the moment when the trajectory leaves the diagonal, one of the populations is getting more dominant. And because of the cross inhibition between the populations, it's getting increasingly difficult with more distance from the diagonal to return back to the diagonal. And this is expressed by the flow fields, the pink lines that you see here in the background with the arrows. So the further away you go from the diagonal, the larger becomes the flow, the velocity towards the black balls that tracked us. When the trajectory reaches such a ball, the trajectory, then a decision is made. And we can see now that depending on the functional connectivity in the system, the balance state along the diagonal is differently long. So the larger the connectivity, the functional connectivity in the network, the longer stays the activity between the population A and B in a balanced state along the diagonal. And this allows the system to integrate more information, to average out the noise um, that is injected, and uh, to also accumulate the evidence that then leads to a better decision. So in summary, here we can see that uh, having more integrated network states leads to a longer integration of evidence, to better decisions, and it prevents from jumping prematurely, as you can see here, to one decision. So now for some um, questions, um, we are uh, um, uh, understanding the physiological brain or brain disease. We need more details in our simulation. So the mean field um, uh, modeling approach has their limitations. And sometimes we need the detail of spiking neural networks. So for this, we have implemented just recently Recently, TVB multiscale as a toolbox to interface between TVB and PyNAS to perform core simulation with NEST, the spiking neuron simulator. You can find the code on the TVB GitHub repository. It is also available as a Docker image that can be executed on any machine and system. And we have also implemented a Jupyter notebook that is illustrating a proof of concept use case that runs on an eBrains web app. This is what you see here. So in this um, use case scenario, the core scale mode in the virtual brain is modeled with the reduced from one model, and uh, the two fine scale spiking modes are um, represented by integrated and fire neurons. 
So I just mentioned um, eBrains. eBrains is uh, the um, e-infrastructure that is being developed by the Human Brain Project. And in the past um, two years, we have worked hard to integrate the virtual brain simulator and the related workflows, for example, the image processing pipeline that generate the derivative data that are integrated in the virtual brain and that are personalizing the virtual brain in the existing um, uh, human brain project platforms. And I uh, would like to show you a very short overview video what um, has been integrated and what kind of workflows are readily available right now for you on eBrains. The Virtual Brain Tool Suite is a large open source ecosystem with an end-to-end -end workflow for creating personalized brain network models and simulating them. It is now available on the European Brain Research Infrastructures, or eBrains Cloud. The Virtual Brain on eBrains, or TBB on eBrains, allows users to construct, simulate, and analyze personalized brain network models. Its powerful features can be used from your local computer, making computationally expensive neurological research possible from the comfort of your web browser. The Virtual Brain Integration in eBrains allows users to have an end-to-end -end experience of personalized brain model creation and multi-scale brain simulation using high-performance computing in the cloud. This makes it possible to process large cohort databases, which in turn makes it possible to produce generalized results. This is a precondition for being able to use these results to develop potential medical treatments, therapies, or diagnostic procedures. The Virtual Brain on eBrains ecosystem software is open source. The software is distributed in the form of execution-ready Docker containers that can be pulled from Docker Hub. The containers can be executed on supercomputers using secure container environments like Saris or Shifter. Jupyter Notebooks enable users to operate the containers on supercomputers directly from their web browser. DVB on eBrains includes a variety of simulation tools, pipelines, and data sets which we will introduce in the course of this video. The Virtual Brain Ecosystem on eBrains contains the Virtual Brain Simulator that can be used in the cloud with a supercomputing backend, ready-to-use pipelines to build personalized brains that enable users to process their own imaging data or shared data with large cohorts, TVB-ready imaging data sets of patients and healthy controls discoverable via eBrains, the TBB multi-scale co-simulation web application, which enables co-simulating some brain regions at a finer scale using the Nest simulator. Fast and parallelizable hardware near implementations of TBB models containerized for direct use on eBrains via CoLab notebooks. The INCF training space with a dedicated area for the virtual brain where a rich multitude of didactic use cases are available with video tutorials, Jupyter notebooks, and example data sets. All software and data sets in the virtual brain ecosystem are registered and annotated in the knowledge graph to make them easier to locate and use. The tools are functional and ready to use, and you can be the next user. Okay, and this brings me to the end. Um, now I want to, at the end to um, introduce to you the virtual brain cloud project that has been started at the end of 2018. It's a consortium of um, 17 partners in Europe, academic partners, but also um, companies, small enterprises, and also patient organizations also in Europe. And the goal is here to integrate systematically multimodal data into virtual brains to identify mechanistic disease markers for diagnosis, prognosis, and therapy of neurodegenerative disease. This includes uh, tool chains for image data processing, model construction, personalized simulation, machine learning, and analysis, and user group tailored output from. So at the heart of the virtual brain cloud stands data security, since we are working with personal data. Several organizational and technical measures are being implemented to enable lawful personalized brain simulation with the virtual brain according to the European GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations. And this includes data security concepts to protect transmission of sensible data and open networks, as well as processing and storing data and shared resources. And this is my final slide. With this, I would like to thank everybody who contributed. Here you see 
my awesome team at the Charité in Berlin who contributed to the project that I was showing you and all the partners that are being involved at the Human Brain Project with eBrains, the Virtual Brain Cloud, uh, Virtual Brain Cloud and of course um, the Virtual Brain um, with my partners and uh, co-founders of the Virtual Brain, Randy McIntosh and Victor Gieser. And I also would like to mention the two software companies with whom we are developing the Virtual Brain Codemart and Codebox. And now I'm available for questions. Thank you, Petra. That was an impressive talk. Um, right now, I only see my own question, so I'm going to go ahead. Let me see. So, uh, are there any efforts to interface the virtual brain? Are there any efforts to interface TVB with Neuron, similar to the TVB Pinus effort? So, currently, um, I am not aware of any active projects, but I might uh, just have missed them. In principle, we are extremely open to those developments. And um, I think uh, as part of the co-simulation framework that is being developed in the last funding period of the Human Brain Project, there will be a lot of activity around the most popular um, simulators that includes Neuron. And I'm sure that um, there will be uh, work also on the interfacing of TVB and Neuron. In this period. Okay, can you hear me, Petra? Okay, so I do not see any more questions. Sure. So I would like to thank you again for your attention and um, yeah, wish you a great remaining coffee break. Thank you, Petra. I don't think we, you can hear us, but that was a great talk. So we'll break now for 20 minutes of coffee break. Is that right? And yes, and yes. we'll be back at 12. Great. See you all at the top of the hour. Thank you so much.
Hi, Charles. Was just checking to make sure that you know how to screen share before we get started. <laughs> this is probably a good idea. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Audio and video looks good. OK, uh, give me one moment. I will try to share my screen. That looks perfect. Excellent. Um, OK, I, I think I'll just leave it like that and, and, and not, not touch anything. Great. Yeah, feel free to turn off audio and video if you want to just go into hiding until we get started. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for uh, getting me set up. No problem.
All right, folks, as you're coming back, just a reminder that um, we'll use the question panel for questions for speakers. Be sure to um, put a note of who the question is for since they'll, um, they may not all be answered during the sessions and they can follow up and type in answers afterward for you. Uh, there's also a link to a Google Doc in the chat. Um, the organizers are using that to come up with questions and comments for discussion session. So please do have a look at that and add any thoughts that you have and want to bring up for discussion. We're gonna have uh, Kale moderating for the second portion today. Looks like he's popping on video now. And I think we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Give a few, a little bit more time for people to rejoin. Kale, I think when it hits nine o'clock, if you wanna introduce our first speaker, we'll be good to go. Great. And just for those of you who don't know, I'm Kale from the Allen Institute. I'm uh, taking over for Salva for the rest of the day. I think he has to finish his presentation at the very last minute. I'm just joking. <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, Um, so it looks like it's nine o'clock. Um, hopefully everyone's back from getting coffee. Um, so next speaker is Charles Linton, who is going to be discussing uh, improvements to the Nest Simulator. Uh, so anytime you're ready, Charles, you can take it away. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for being here and uh, to the organizers for their invitation. Um, I will be talking about um, Nest Simulator, but more specifically about a modeling language that's used in Nest Simulator, which is called NestML. Um, first, I will just briefly introduce Nest Simulator in two slides. Um, as we've already discussed in uh, many of the previous talks before me, uh, simulation is becoming increasingly multiscale. And uh, integration of, of various levels of description um, are, are now becoming, I, I guess we're kind of getting our neural simulators to the point where everything is working so well that we can take the next step, which is to, uh, to do that multi-scale integration. So this is a really cool uh, time, I guess, to, to, uh, to be doing this work in. Um, anyway, so I have like a rough uh, level of detail access sketched here. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we saw the, the virtual brain, uh, really cool presentation. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, then um, it, it tends to be that there are no spiking models in, in the virtual brain. You would tend to use population models. So you would have a bit of a coarser grain of description. So you would be more to the left on this axis. Um, and then we've seen some of the um, yeah, uh, pathways between uh, different proteins and enzymes and so on in, in moose, uh, which would be to the right end of the scale. Um, so um, it, Nest has a particular um, optimum point and um, Nest is, is uh, main strength is in the, the point neuron models, uh, spiking and rate based. And um, we are also uh, extending our models library with uh, the so-called meso compartmental models, where you have only a few models, uh, only a few compartments. Uh, so a point neuron would only have one compartment, typically corresponding to the soma. But you could also add, for example, one extra compartment that might correspond to an active dendrite, and you can get very um, interesting behavior that way, and especially uh, very interesting learning rules. Um, so it, it seems that there are two general approaches to doing this multi-scale integration. Uh, one is to write one tool that encompasses this whole axis, which seems to be the direction that, that Moose is heading for, and this is very impressive. Um, and the other approach um, is kind of, I guess, this more organic uh, approach where these different uh, tools are achieving a certain level of maturity that allows us then to take the next step and, and uh, 
um, make them uh, talk to one another. And this is the uh, co-generation. I think that term uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, and then just as a, a, a final illustration of Nest Simulator, so this is one of the um, uh, particular use case that um, is uh, very actively worked on in, in Nest Simulator. Uh, so this is a model of different cortical regions uh, of the macaque visual cortex. Um, one of these nodes in the graph uh, corresponds to this um, four-layer cortical model that you see in the top left. Uh, so this is replicated uh, on each of the nodes in the, in the graph here. Um, so let's see, we have a full density model. Um, yeah, this is based on experimental data. And um, it, it's at the point where um, if you send an artificial stimulus into this network, then it will uh, accurately reproduce the firing statistics uh, of the actual visual cortex in the monkey. Um, so this is a very complex model. I, I don't know exactly how many neurons are, are in here. Uh, I think there are uh, 10,000 per uh, cortical layer, and we have four layers. Uh, times 32 areas um, to give you a rough idea. Um, but um, Nest works well, uh, maybe a, this is a different type of scale, but the scale of just the size of the network. Um, so you can uh, get started and, and write your own uh, little Nest simulation in, in four lines of Python code. And uh, the, the beauty and the strength of Nest is that uh, it scales really well. So Nest does not yet have uh, GPU support. It's uh, targeted towards um, general purpose uh, CPU architectures. Um, and, and this actually allows us to scale almost without an upper limit. So if we have a, an HPC system that is uh, uh, twice as powerful, I have twice as many nodes, then we can simulate a network that's almost twice as large uh, without uh, upper boundary. And um, yeah, so that's just as a, as a brief introduction to Nest Simulator for those of you who don't know it yet. And then I will move to NestML, uh, which is kind of the, uh, the sub-project that, that I'm working on. NestML is a, is a modeling language. Um, it was designed to facilitate the workflow that, that you see on screen here. Uh, so on the top left, you have some, some mechanism from biology uh, that you observe. And then typically, you make a theoretical model, uh, like this electrical circuit, or maybe some uh, collection of stochastic differential equations. And then as a next step, you have your theoretical model, and then you want to simulate it. You want to investigate it in a dynamical simulation. And to do this, you need to uh, kind of translate your theoretical model into a language that the computer will uh, be able to, to simulate in, a, in a, formal um, a formal manner. So by that, I mean to have a precisely defined syntax and semantics. Um, now, I, I don't think it will come as a surprise in this uh, group of people that there are quite a few modeling languages out there that you could, uh, in principle, use for this. Um, NestML is, is lightweight and self-contained, and it aims for kind of a minimalistic syntax inspired by Python. Um, in addition to be able, uh, being able to define stochastic differential equations directly in the language, um, which you can see an example of in the equations block here on the right, uh, there is also an update block on the bottom, where you can write statements, uh, loops, and functions as you would in a typical imperative programming language. A small set of predefined functions. Uh, here we see integrate ODEs and emit spike. Um, then interface with whatever simulation engine uh, you are using for your actual dynamic simulation, be it uh, Nest Simulator or some neuromorphic platform. Um, typically, what this workflow would look like from the, uh, the end user's perspective is that you begin on the left with a collection of neuron models. So these are essentially just plain text files uh, with a .nestml extension. And um, you would then feed these into the, the tool chain. So nestml kind of has, has uh, um, two sides of the coin. Uh, on the one hand, it's a, a specification language. And on the other side, it's a code generation uh, framework. So you would feed your uh, NestML model into this uh, code generator that we call PyNestML. So this does the, uh, the, the reading in of the model, um, making uh, turning the plain text description into an abstract syntax tree that you can then further manipulate, uh, do uh, sanity checks on, like are the physical units consistent and then um, what that will do for you, so if you, um, if you see the command on the bottom left, you will call uh, pynestml by just typing nestml on your uh, command line. And then um, it will generate code 
for, in this case, the default target platform, which is Nest Simulator. Uh, compile it, build it, uh, and, and this will uh, be um, a dynamic uh, library. So in, in Linux.so uh, file or in Windows.dll. Uh, and then uh, this is kind of ready for use. So now you have your user module. And when you have the, uh, the simulation script that you're using for your simulation on the top right, um, what you would then tend to do to get access to the models that you just generated code for is just to do uh, the loading of, of this user module, um, which you do by calling nest.install. And in this case, I just call it nestml module. Um, this then makes available the, the module, uh, the, the models that are contained within that module. So then you can do nest.create with the name of uh, whatever nestml model uh, you, uh, you fed in. Um, I just make a, a very brief plug for uh, one of the, the tools that's a component of this and that we spun off as its own separate tool. So this started off as uh, just being integrated in, into NestML itself. Um, so I, I mentioned that in NestML, you can, uh, in, in a very intuitive manner, enter differential equations. I have some examples of that on the top left. And so we have this uh, particular uh, Python package called ODE Toolbox that then takes in this textual description and does symbolic analysis using SymPy and does things like um, benchmarking of different numeric solvers um, such that it can recommend what code um, you should generate, what, what solver you should use in the generated code. Uh, so for, for example, it can adjudicate between a, a stiff solver or a non-stiff solver. Um, Right, um, so that's uh, uh, kind of the, the introduction. And now um, the thing that I am uh, presently working on in particular is to extend the NestML modeling language to cover synapses and synaptic plasticity. Um, so here we see a workflow uh, analogous to the, the previous slide for the neuron, except that now that we're looking at a, at a synapse. So there is some uh, mechanism in biology on the top left. Uh, we build our theoretical model uh, that we see in the bottom left. In this case, that will be indicated by the fitted uh, continuous black lines. So this is our uh, theoretical SCDP model. And then the next step is that we, uh, um, we want to interrogate this model in a dynamical simulation. So we formulate it in, in this case, NestML. Um, so just to briefly describe what we're uh, looking at here in the code. And now I'm actually curious. Yes, you can see my mouse pointer. That's excellent. Um, OK, so in, in general, um, we are defining an SCP synapse. So it's characterized by a weight, W, that can uh, change over time. And uh, it will be updated by facilitation and depression rules. And the strength of this facilitation and depression depends on what we call uh, a trace variable. Um, in this model, I call them TR pre and TR post. So a trace value for the presynaptic neuron that's connected to the synapse and a trace value for the postsynaptic neuron that's connected to the synapse. And these are going to record the history of pre and postsynaptic spiking activity. So whenever a presynaptic spike arrives, um, we invoke the statements in the pre-receive block that you can see here. And you see there that the, the presynaptic trace, so TR pre, will be incremented by one. And then if you look at the equations block for the dynamical equation for TR pre, you see that it will just decay back to zero in an uh, exponential manner with a given time constant. Um, so now we have these uh, these two variables, and, and then the similar uh, similarly, it will happen for the postsynaptic part. So now we have these two trace variables in place that are going to record the, the spiking history of pre and postsynaptic partners, and um, this will then be used to calculate the weight update uh, for this synapse. So now we run into an issue. Um, these traces are necessary to simulate this SDP model. Um, so it, it makes sense that their dynamics, so the dynamical equation for TR pre and TR post, is defined in the synapse model. Um, so, you know, if you have a, a different synapse model uh, for some um, short term plasticity rule, for example, you might not need these traces at all. And especially if you have a static synapse that is non plastic, then of course you don't need any of this. Um, However, so then, but if we were to naively generate code for the Sinus model, then that means that every Sinus model is going to be um, recording these traces for all of the pre and post synaptic partners that they're connected to. 
So obviously, that's a huge amount of redundancy. And this is not very practical. So we need to come up with a way um, to address this. Um, so just to illustrate um, what this would currently look like. So in, in principle, um, this would work. Um, we could generate the code. Uh, the, the synapses would all be maintaining this state uh, in a massively redundant manner. But OK, at, at least in principle, that would work with the existing workflow. And just to, just to drive that home, uh, because I'm going to be looking at the, the differences that need to be uh, made to this workflow. So again, you start off at the left with a collection of neuron models and now also some sinus models. And it's important to note that this is it's a set. So um, each of these models is completely disjoint from one another. Um, the neuron model does not know that there is a sinus model. Um, but so you just take that as, as one big collection, as one big set, uh, feed it into the, the tool chain. It will uh, generate the code for you, the user module. And then you can instantiate um, now both the neuron as well as that synapse in your simulation script. So we were doing a nested create, so we're, we're um, generating code for an integrated fire uh, neuron with postsynaptic currents uh, that have an exponential kernel. So that there, that's where the name comes from, IFPSC exp. So this was our uh, neuron model that we defined in our nestml file. We generated code for it, loaded the module, and so on. So now we can use it in the simulation script. And the same for the, uh, the SMP model. We named it SCDP. So now we can make that connection with nest.connect using Sinus model SCDP. So that's the name that uniquely refers back to that neuron model. Um, so now what, what we're going to do is we, we somehow need to come up with a way to eliminate this redundancy. right? So the problem is that all of these synapses are going to redundantly maintain uh, both the, the state value, so they're going to have um, an extra memory allocation for these state values, and they're going to have an extra uh, computational overhead because at every time step, the state of the trace values needs to be updated. Um, so this is the situation as it now is. So we have our sinus model on the left, and the run model on the right. And now we're going to do what I like to refer to as abstract syntax tree surgery. So we're actually going to implement a completely automated workflow for identifying the um, state variables that are redundant. So if we make the assumption that uh, this particular neuron model will be used together with this particular sinus model, um, then we can identify um, just by uh, an, a completely automated analysis in these models. Uh, which variables in the synapse model do not, strictly speaking, need to be there, but which can be moved to the neuron model um, in order to reduce the redundancy. So um, I will not go into too much detail of, of how this works, but basically we, we identify this based on a dependency analysis. So we identify the variables that strictly need to be in the, in the synapse because they're used um, in the plasticity rules, or for example, the, uh, the state W, which uh, maintains the, the strength of the synapse. Of course, we cannot move that to the neuron uh, because we need to access it in the synapse when we want to do facilitation depression. And, um, and so it is skipped in this dependency analysis. And then, so at the end of this analysis, we, uh, we obtain this list um, of all the uh, state variables that can be moved from synapse to neuron. And we also cover the um, parameters that are used only by equations uh, that will be moved. Um, so we really take everything that can possibly go from the synapse to the neuron and uh, basically uh, move that right on over. Um, of course, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, nitty gritty um, that has to, um, has to be taken care of when doing this. And um, we're, we're still investigating um, uh, completely how uh, generic we can make this. For example, uh, let's say that you have um, uh, state variables in your sinus model that could, in principle, be moved to the neuron model because they're, uh, they would otherwise be redundant. However, in, the, um, uh, in, in this imperative programming block, you would 
do some operation on them. You would, I don't know, read them, uh, do some calculation, and write them back. Um, now, if that is a self-contained block of code, then okay, that can trivially be moved to the synapse, uh, to the neuron. But um, once you have more than one of these pieces of code, then uh, you might run into issues where the relative time at which these are executed uh, could have an impact on the results. Um, so we are presently evaluating if we can break this. We haven't broken it yet, but it's still in an alpha prototype stage. Um, so yeah, so basically we move that. Um, yeah, I will not bore you with the details of, of all the abstract syntax tree operations that have to happen, but uh, fortunately the abstract syntax tree is a, it's a tree structure, a tree data structure. So it lends itself quite well uh, to these kind of operations. Um, right, so now, okay, so we have that in place. We're, we're going to modify our Sinus model and neuron model in transit, so to speak. Um, and how does this affect our workflow? So we still start off at the left with this uh, collection of neuron model and, and Sinus models. We still invoke NestML in the same way. So the way that we uh, generate the code for this is still, uh, from the end user perspective, uh, has not changed. Um, but there is a slight change um, in, um, oh, hang on, sorry. I, I think my slide wasn't updating. So um, so what, what we need to do now is to indicate uh, to the code generator that this particular neuron model will be used in tandem with this particular status model. Uh, because um, the, um, the way that the neuron will ultimately be connected in the network uh, will determine if these dynamic uh, uh, state values can be moved from synapse to neuron. If it turns out that we're not actually connecting this neuron with SDP synapses, but just with static synapses, then we, we don't need to do all these operations. Even though we might still have the SDP model uh, that we generate code for, but now it is, it, so we're gonna really tailor um, our neuron models to our synapse models and vice versa. So it is now important that we indicate to the code generator um, that these, um, that this neuron will be used in tandem with the synapse. And, and so you can refer to this as, um, as, a, as a dyad. So there will always be used as a as a pair. Um, and the way we specify this is just really simple. So we just have a, a list of pairs of names uh, that we have in a JSON file. We just feed this into our uh, code generator. And um, this will automatically then take care of all this analysis uh, of the dependencies, the moving of the variables, and the generation of the code. Um, what will then change when you run your simulation? So now we have this particular neuron model that is really, um, up, it goes further than just being optimized to use with this synapse model. It is now uh, so customized to be used with this synapse that it doesn't make much sense to use it with other synapse types. So we now don't have our generic IAF PSC X neuron that we started with. But we now have this one that's really tailored for this SDP synapse. So now we have it uh, uh, change the name. So our code generator changed the name for us to, to add this with SDP uh, suffix. And similarly for the SDP synapse, we now have this SDP synapse that is so tailored for the neuron model that we add this uh, for PSC exp uh, suffix. Now that's all well and good. And um, that, that will work perfectly fine, except that it, it's maybe not so convenient for the end user to be uh, concerned with what may be an implementation detail. I mean, you could say that this is just a, an optimization detail that really should be uh, behind the scenes. And uh, yes, well, I agree. So uh, the next step in this pipeline would then be that we eliminate this uh, JSON file that you have to specify explicitly the neurons that you will be using with particular uh, synapses. Uh, this will then also be automatically detected for you. So we're really moving towards as much automation as we can. Um, but like I said, we only know uh, which neurons will be used with which synapses uh, in the simulation script itself. So only uh, once you, you, know, you import nest, you do the nest.create, 
you do your nested connect. And really only at the point where you call nested connect does the, the nest backend have any way of knowing that um, this neuron will be used to design it. Um, so for this reason, and this explains the just-in-time compilation part of my title, um, so my proposal now is uh, to add this JIT component into Nest Simulator. So the NestML part of the story, I, I already have the, the working alpha uh, stage prototype. Um, but to make this completely transparent to the user, such that you don't have to deal with uh, specifying this JSON file and with these uh, suffixes to your model names, we need further integration with Nest Simulator. So we are now working on um, an extension to the PyNest uh, backend that will automatically invoke ne the NestML code generator um, when you run your simulation script. So instead of this earlier workflow where you begin with some models, you kind of manually invoke NestML to make a user module, and then you load your user module in, uh, in your simulation script. Now, all of that will be behind the scenes. Um, the, um, yeah. So we're yeah we're striving towards a, a full full automation of that. Um, so just to summarize, um, yeah, NestML. Um, so like I said, it's kind of a two-sided coin. Uh, we're a specification uh, modeling language, but we're also this uh, code generation framework. So one of the strengths is that we can generate highly optimized code for a particular target platform. And not just Nest Simulator, but we're also targeting the Spinnaker Neuromorphic Platform, for example. And we can only do these really, uh, yeah, squeezing the, the last bit of performance out of it um, if we do this processing uh, as a DAD. So where we do not process neurons independently and synapses independently, but we explicitly make these, uh, yeah, links between them, these pairs between them. Um, And I pressed the wrong key. Um, yeah, it's basically uh, what I already covered. So uh, from the end user perspective, uh, this is maybe good to point out. So this this has, uh, for, for the end user, this has an advantage and a disadvantage. Uh, the advantage is that this will all be done uh, fully transparently. So uh, you will not even have to manually invoke NestML anymore. And the disadvantage is that um, the first time that you run your simulation script uh, might take uh, a little while longer <laughs> on the order of maybe half a minute uh, because it will um, have to do this uh, code generation and compilation and building and uh, the simulators written in C++. So compilation could be faster. And I think this is also something that we will be working on. Uh, but of course, the second time you, around that you run your script, um, it will use a cached value and uh, it will be instantaneous. Um, in general, I, I checked a bit with the supercomputer guys at, at Yuli, and uh, even even Python is now commonly available on supercomputers. Um, so, I, because the PyNestML uh, toolchain, as as you guessed, is written in Python, um, just in case uh, Python should not be available, then you can of course always manually invoke NestML and uh, generate your models in advance. Um, yeah, that's basically everything I had to say. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I uh, look forward to any questions you might have. Uh, thank you very much, Earl. Um, great talk. Um, we have one question at the moment. Can you see it, or I can read it off to you? Let me take a look. Uh, to what extent is the identification of temporal and other de dependencies in NP complete problem? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, uh, that's a that's a very interesting question. I didn't think about complexity, but because the the yeah kind of the, the size. I'm not sure if that's maybe the right term to use, but the the complexity of a model, if you will, if you just measure that in purely in in source lines of code, um, I think that will in in practical cases that will be restricted enough such that it it we don't really have to worry about this. Uh, the complexity of it. Yeah. yeah. And then I see a uh, second question. Uh, what is the level of support for NestML in the latest Nest release? Uh, we're kind of between versions right now. 
Um, so I would I would recommend um, that you, if if you want to get started with this, then uh, for the moment I recommend that you use uh, the Docker image that we distribute. And um, we will in the coming weeks be releasing the latest version of NestML that does not yet include the um, the this uh, yeah the, the synapse and neuron code generation that I talked about, uh, but will have a lot of um, uh, feature enhancements, and then hopefully the um, the synapse neuron code generation that's a bit of a longer term project, uh, because we also also need to do the integration with uh, a simulator there. And uh, I see a third question: When you perform such transformations, how do you handle scenarios when users? are recording certain variables. Yeah, when you move stuff around. Yes, that's absolutely. So you, you would be specifying these trace variables in your SCDP model and your Sinus model. So you would expect to, to find them there uh, also when you do the recording. Um, so yeah, this this is in an, in an automated fashion. Uh, we also create a proxy for that um, that um, is lightweight. So there's no... Uh, memory overhead, and I think the runtime overhead would just be one uh, pointer to referencing. I have one quick question, maybe a suggestion, but um, do you support or planning on the support like imports and include statements so that you know these large you know, model directories can be simplified? Um, this is, this is a... A very good question, and it's something that I, I personally would like to work towards. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe we can we can take that up in the discussion later because I think that that there will be a very interesting point to elaborate on the, the kind of modularity uh, that we can achieve in the, in these models. Okay, uh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we're going to have a discussion at the moment. Um, so if you want to, if you want to uh, uh, turn off your screen sharing, um, uh, you can invite Salva and Porig uh, up on the screen. I think Porig can sort of lead this discussion section. He's. I believe Porig is connecting. I've got you all on video now. Okay. Hello there. Um, you can see me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I think the idea with this uh, discussion session was try to get um, some high-level questions that uh, people had about uh, simulators, simulator technology, uh, software for large-scale uh, simulation, uh, <clears throat> and have, if anybody had some broad questions or comments across all of the uh, talks they've seen, the talks that might be coming up. Um, and just have a, an open discussion session on where we're at and where we're going to. So the first general question, um, uh, I have uh, put the link for the document in the chat. I don't know if somebody else can uh, put it in again. Uh, the first general question was, where will or should sim neuronal simulation technology be in five years' time? So we have some uh, tools that are in development, some interesting um, up and coming developments, but um, if we look forward five years time, where would we ideally like to be and what do we need to actually get there? Is there something completely missing from what's being developed at the moment? Are uh, simulators just not powerful enough for the kind of questions we want to ask? Uh, so do people have questions or comments on that? Or do people think everything is there and we solve the brain within five years? Probably not. So um, I don't know what the best way to. Uh, uh, so uh, to just so people can uh, um, dive in questions on the chat. 
there are also questions coming up on the um, questions and answers. Uh, Dave Beeman has asked, uh, what are the prospects for network modeling with several compartments per cell? Um, I was under the impression that um, lots of these network models uh, have uh, lots of uh, compartments per cell, or actually was that maybe a question for Nest, Nest ML? Quite possibly. So, uh, <laughs> one of the uh, comments in the uh, chat is that uh, Neuron looks really old. Uh, Fortunately, um, yes. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so Dave's uh, question was, uh, sorry, that was about Nest. Okay, fair enough. You can um, hopefully maybe. Um, okay, um, but, 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 but this is uh, Yes, uh, Charles, uh, if you can respond in the chat, that would be great. Um, uh, Okay, so just on the general point that uh, Genghis uh, raised uh, about neural looks really old, a number of the uh, tools that are in development at the moment, including um, uh, NetPine, which we'll hear about uh, later, and I believe there's a new API, a GUI for uh, Nest. A lot of the tools are looking into new um, web-based um, interfaces for making it easier to um, interface with these uh, tools. So yes, a lot of people, I'm sure, will want a nice, clean interface for setting up these type of models, um, like Gepetto as well. Um, so there, there, there is, there are some developments um, uh, in progress behind these, and it would be nice if a lot of these tools can be accessed online, can be much easier to use. Um, but the core of it, um, a lot of people out there are looking at making Nest. Um, uh, much more efficient, making Arbor and making new simulators. Neuron is incredibly efficient at these type of things. Sometimes what lets uh, some of these down is uh, a nice interface, and there are certainly um, uh, people working on that. Okay, um, so are there any other comments in here? Um, maybe if someone wants to um connect um, if they have a webcam or microphone, uh, we can invite them up and they can uh, discuss. If you if you want to, just maybe say, invite, you know, ask in the comments. And then our, mod, uh, our admin can invite you maybe. OK. So um, if somebody would like to uh, suggest being added. Um, I'm just trying to find the documents. Inviting Jim Bauer on the screen right now. Ooh. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, can nice you tell us? So far. Can Can you tell us where you think um, simulation technology should be in five years' time? Do you have any where, opinions about this? Where it should have been ten years ago. In five years' time. Ah. So I think that as you, some of you have heard me say in comments, and some of you have heard me say for years that it's really time that this field start coalescing around specific models. So instead of having who knows how many models of the hippocampus and pyramidal cells and hippocampal pyramidal neurons and cerebellum and Purkinje cells and all the rest, we really need to start coalescing around specific community models, um, which then can be used to coordinate research in computational neuroscience, you know, provide a paradigm in the Kuhnian sense uh, for us to all work in, et cetera. So the question is this, um, for that to happen requires more infrastructure than simply posting code online. There are many, many things. A big piece of the infrastructure, and Patrick, you know we've talked about this before, is actually figuring out how to have those community models published and how to have people's individual contributions to community models be recognized. 
Uh, and that requires software and systems to do it. Um, so, right. So I think that, you know, to really move this field forward, I mean, I've been, as you know, <laughs> around the CNS meeting for 29 years. And I sit and I watch talks, and there's no question that the sophistication of the models is increasing. The amount of data connected to the models is increasing. Uh, for example, the genetic connections that were shown the other day in a very nice hippocampal model, <clears throat> the analysis tools are more sophisticated, the visualization tools are more sophisticated, but I still have to listen to people announce that they discovered something with their model that actually we knew 29 years ago or 25 years ago from modeling. So how do we build a bottle of mo model understanding based on models of what the current state of our understanding of the hippocampus is, <clears throat> what's common in our understanding, and where do we differ? The only way to do that is with models. And the question then, the only way, you can't do it by writing papers, you can't do it by discussion. It's too, the systems are too complicated. The system we're studying is too complicated. <clears throat> so <clears throat> my question is not, I have a series of answers you don't want to hear necessarily, <clears throat> but my question is, what tools do we need to build to specifically promote and increase the use of community models, the development of community models in a way that actually gives people the credit they need, <clears throat> the attribution they need, and a process for moving forward. <clears throat> and I think we as model builders and we as model simulation builders really should be thinking about that. And by the way, just to return to one more last thing, I know, Patrick, but I, I'll stop one second. To return to the question a few minutes ago about neuron being kind of old, it's the guts of neuron that at this point may need to be changed, not the not the AI, not the interface. And I critical, believe critical tomorrow we have a talk on core neuron, so great. Well, we might hear an update on that. That is critical to the community model <coughs> model issue because how do you actually store a community model and what form do you store it? You know, how does a simulator interact with it? All of those questions are key. And it would be great if the very talented people, including the ones on this panel, uh, and the tremendous effort in Nest and everywhere else, Moose and everywhere else, that all everyone could get together and say, let's figure out how to do this and what skills and what tools do we need to really promote community models. So that's what I think needs to happen in the next five years. And I would. <laughs> I think it will fundamentally change not only computational neuroscience, but ultimately neuroscience by providing a theoretical or a model base for a field which otherwise now is essentially sort of uh, folkloric. I would hope, certainly, that uh, there's a number of talks coming up, uh, including one on Pine, which uh, covers a number of different simulators, one on Neuromel. Uh, which covers a format into which uh, you can map these models into multiple simulators. Um, on Core Neuron, um, there is um, some serious work happening on the internals of Neuron. Um, there are a number of uh, other new simulators coming out, and I think a lot more people now are sharing their models on GitHub, hopefully on Open Source Brain that I'll plug again for myself. Um, but I think we are starting to get to a point where Everybody here knows all of these tools. Thankfully, I didn't even have to ask. They're all open source. They're all uh, sharing uh, the code. They're all sharing the models. Um, and it's all on GitHub. There is a single place where you can see these. There's a lot happening in the Human uh, Brain Project. We'll hear about uh, tomorrow, the infrastructure there. So I, I do think we're getting to being the default is to share these things. And it's it's hopefully forums like this that uh, we people can just find out what's actually out there and start talking about. But uh, one more point, just to be clear, it's not sharing code. Sharing is really a sociological issue. It's a structure of science issue. And so the tools that need to be developed are really tools that allow the sociology, the pedagogy, the structure of computational neuroscience to change. So yes, open source, great. 
I mean, we've had model DB for a long time. And the, and the open source systems now and the model depository systems now are much better than they were 10 years ago, no question. But the real, the real issue is if you took everybody currently building a model of CA1 and sat them down in a room and said, let's, have, let's figure out a common model, the pieces that we all agree to, and then we will all ourselves individually work on our own piece, what we think, okay, about how things really work, but with a common core. At this point, after 30 years, we should be able to come with a common description of CA1, at least at the base. Then it's a sociological question. How do those different efforts mesh? How do we trace contributions of individuals to a community model? How does that get to be credited? How do we publish that model, for example? Do we keep publishing in paper? I mean, these are core questions that are really sociological, epistemological structure of science issues. And the no, tools need to reflect and, and support those. So it's different yeah. than just publishing open source and making models available. It's really how do we coordinate, you know, last point, yeah. Newton started the first scientific journal so that he could control the field, actually, was why he did it. But the Royal Transactions, the Transactions of the Royal Society, ended up moving physics forward dramatically because there was now a common place to publish models and what people were doing. It formed a base. We need to do something similar, I think. And yeah. I'll get off. I will say. I will that. say there has been a specific initiative uh, to um, get a community model of CA1, area CA1, uh, specifically pyramidal cells, that has been around for the last four or five years. And it came specifically out of the Human Brain Project. Uh, Elif Muller, who was originally in the Blue Brain Project, he had this initiative to get uh, CA1 people together and um, share models, come up with community specific models. Unfortunately, Elif has left the field, but uh, that was a specific initiative from within the um, uh, Blue Brain Project, the Human Brain Project. Um, so, I mean, people are trying to do this. They are trying to get together. The only problem is if you're not part of that initiative, if you have funding to do something else, usually people will build their own thing. So there is there are certainly social issues, but I, I do think it's improving and people are actually trying to go into that uh, direction. Great, uh, thank you. To, Thank you. Um, to move on, we have some else. Erica, who would like to ask a question? Hi, hello. Yes, I work with uh, Salvador. I'm a grad student in, uh, in Bill Witten's lab. Um, so yeah, I think uh, one of the things that has been, you know, very time consuming and challenging um, in terms of the stuff that you know I've been working on is is optimizing uh, both single cell models and network models to data. Um, and it seems like across platform that's pretty heterogeneous, within platform pretty heterogeneous, there's all, you know, there's adaptive stochastic descent, there's Optuna, there's all these, um, there's all these different algorithms. So, you know, I kind of wanted to see if anyone had a more streamlined or coordinated vision for the future, whether that's um, an optimization tool that kind of exists outside of these platforms and operates independently or something else like that. We'd just be curious to see, you know, what people think, because I think something like that could be, could be useful. Yeah. I mean, well, from my own experience, um, there are a lot of these tools out there. Um, quite often what happens is that a grad student will have a problem to uh, try to solve. They will come up with something themselves. It will expand to a certain extent. And then there's another optimization tool in the community, which is fine. Probably what needs to happen is somebody actually just make a list of these, point to these, try to get these people together and see, well, is there overlap in these um, and actually instead of developing something new, just actually point to the 10 different platforms that are out there that uh, have actually been um, used over the years. Um, and hopefully then somebody can see that and actually uh, find something new, find something existing rather than developing something new themselves. But there isn't, there certainly isn't anybody in neuroscience which says that is the proper tool to use because with a lot of these, they are actually, um, uh, you need something that's customizable. You need something that you know the ins and outs of. And if somebody in the lab is using this particular tool, mm -hmm. uh, other people associated will use it. But there's, there certainly would be nice. It would be nice to have multiple instances of these optimization tools that you could compare one against the other um, and actually just maybe 
find out which is fastest, most useful, and so on. So um, somebody looking into the issue in the field, finding all of these different things, pointing to them would be quite useful. And yeah, hopefully. Thank you very much. Um, OK, we have a couple of other questions. Um, uh, there was one which was voted up, but I think it was slightly earlier. Uh, would that language be suitable to model other brain cells uh, or their effects on neurons like astrocytes? I think, yes, sorry, I think that was specifically for nest ML, so maybe that's one for the chat. Um, other questions regarding five years from now, I wonder what people think, will we do all modeling on the cloud exclusively? Is that the way to go, the only way? So I think certainly uh, a lot more will be happening on the cloud. Um, other comments are very welcome. Um, but yeah, th there are resources out there. There's commercial uh, services, Amazon and Google. Uh, most universities have fairly high powered uh, machines that they uh, give access to. So more and more will actually start to move to these um, uh, other platforms. Oh, and there's Anton. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, what's your feeling? Um, do you think uh, everything is going to move to the cloud? <laughs> um, I think a lot is going to move to the cloud. It seems like this is a general trend in the field. Also, that would really help to address some of the issues of um, sharing and you know community standards that that uh, that we discussed just a few minutes ago. So. Uh, I think it's it's uh, the way to go in a way. Um, a lot of the tools are available already, and you know a lot of the other existing tools probably can be refined to to be used efficiently on the cloud. So it's hard for me to see downsides or you know what kind of applications would not be suitable for the cloud. What what would you think about people just? being reluctant to share their um, models, share their data, and not actually want. So if if some platform, if some initiative was offering, OK, here is uh, some place to share your model or run your model, uh, they might think, well, actually, I haven't published this yet. I don't want it anywhere off my laptop. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's something that happens and probably will happen. Uh, my point of view is that ideally we would, uh, you know, it's, it's a sociological issue also, as, as uh, Jim mentioned, and um, you know, as many people discuss. But um, I think as a community, we want people to share, uh, and you know, like I, I'm a Dallin Institute. Our um, motto has always been open science. <laughs> So we want to share our data, our models. Uh, I mean, very often we share them before publication, sometimes yep. years before publication. Yep. And we hope that, um, and, and, and a lot of community also, you know, follow some of the same, uh, some of the same uh, guidelines. Uh, yep. We can also look to other fields, you know, in, in some other fields, like in, in uh, some areas of physics, people often share data before publication or they, they, you know, for them a publication is a archive paper rather than a, you know, peer reviewed paper that appears two years after you actually have written it. Um, I, I mean, I, I can, I can think about some cases where it was, it, it would be uh, maybe uh, desirable to publish the paper first and then share the data. But generally, I think it would be great for the field if we move to the situation where I, everything on the cloud we have models we have data on yep. the cloud and then uh, paper is you know later maybe some advertisement of some of the results of some of the data yeah i do get the impression that a lot of uh, students now their first instinct uh, would be to develop something publicly in github put it out there if anybody's interested and so on do some analysis themselves um, but they're happy to share that and happy for somebody to show interest until the point where they actually publish it um, they may, their PI may disagree with that, but um, yeah, I think that's a default for a lot of people developing um, software. Um, just one of the comments on the uh, chat about um, sharing on the cloud. Uh, uh, somebody pointed out about uh, NSG, the Neuroscience Gateway. There is a uh, talk tomorrow 
about NSG, which uh, does offer supercomputing facilities if you want to run uh, Nest, if you want to run Neuron, if you want to run lots, lots of different um, simulators, they will give you access to uh, supercomputing facilities in the US. Um, and you can find out about all of that uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, OK, are there other people? Thank you. Um, are there any other people asking questions here? Um, or any other comments? Let me look in the doc to see uh, what tools, resources are currently missing in the field. I'm just going to read out some of the comments that were added there. Um, as everything is moved into the browser, should we move from Python to JavaScript-based technologies to enable truly distributed computing without having to run servers? Um, so there was a suggestion that um, instead of running um, on servers, you have a nice, powerful machine yourself. You could maybe um, uh, run something or maybe translate it into JavaScript, run it in the browser itself. Um, that could be possible. I don't think I've seen any recently. Uh, maybe the front end might run in JavaScript in your browser, um, but it would always be quite powerful to actually have a back end where the simulation is run. And I think it would be difficult to translate Nestor Neuron into pure JavaScript, but we should see. We'll see. Um, the other comment was, um, are Google Collab and other Jupyter Hub environments a solution? They still require running a kernel process that is now owned by Google or other entity that may remove, limit them at some point. So yes, a lot of um, um, scenarios involve running a, a notebook um, in your browser. It could be, it would be connected to a, a kernel in the on the server. Um, the question there about where that's actually running, but you can actually uh, save these notebooks. You can share these, for example, in GitHub and um, save them in that way and even run them locally on a um, your own machine if you want to download the notebook. Um, to, to, to. Is there any survey or other attempt at understanding the, the needs of the field? For example, a lot of effort has been put into standardizing descriptions. While, idios while idiosyncratic model descriptions may confuse a young student after some experience, debugging a model is what takes the most time and effort. So this was um, in relation to what tools or resources missing currently missing in the field. Uh, certainly, it's the case that um, uh, documentation, tutorials, uh, ways to get people um, using uh, a lot of these tools uh, are sometimes really needed for particular simulators. Uh, so it would be quite important to get new people into the field, uh, get new people looking at um, uh, some of these tools that are out there and try to make it easy for them to um, uh, get on board with these simulations. Hopefully, if some of these uh, involve um, accessing it through the browser, it would make it a lot easier. And hopefully, that's the direction that it's uh, moving in. If I could also comment on that a little bit, and I think uh, on what Jim Brower said, especially in the comments, um, one of the one of the hard parts about using getting people to use these tools is not just for students, but also for you know people who are in the lab constantly. They have these large models. But when it comes to the math and the programming, you know, I, I know they tend to be, it, it's, it's hard to get them to use this. So maybe we should also be focusing on getting actual people from a wet lab um, to, you know, without even a second thought, without having to push them to be able to say, yes, I have this model of this part of the mouse brain. You know, I've done all the wet lab work. I've, you know, done all, I've done all the, statistical analysis the next the very next step always has to be you know, how am i going to create a model for that a computational model mm -hmm. uh, and that's a really hard thing to sell them because you know we all spent years you know learning how to program and learning the you know how to understand the Hodgson huxley equation uh, I mean, uh, I'm hopeful that there are some very nice looking uh, interfaces coming out. Uh, we're going to hear from NetPine uh, yeah. later today. We're going to hear from a few others along the way. And we're also going to, I believe, uh, get um, some models running in a browser, maybe during the next talk. Um, and that's maybe, um, yeah, unless there are any last minute questions. I see Dan has come up there. Hi, Dan. Um, is there any last minute questions? I can't follow them all in the chat. Um, does anybody else want to jump in just for one last minute comment? Hmm. 
we should try it. Okay, I think people are eager to hear about Brian then. Uh, so, um, we have maybe a few more minutes, so let me just see. Okay, we're still on. Okay. Uh, so one final comment, I think that might certainly have been still for uh, Nestemel. Uh, my concern is that um, Genesis and Neuron, the only simulators that can use sufficient dendritic morphologies for network calculation of evoked potentials, what options exist for modern simulators? Uh, I think that was hopefully answered with uh, Arbor. Um, I believe um, Brian has some support for uh, multi-compartmental uh, cell models. Um, but that's probably not what you're going to be talking about in this talk. Okay. Um, I will actually have one slide on that. But... Okay, that's fine. Well, I think we can probably get going um, already with Brian. Um, so Dan, you're going to introduce uh, Brian and Brian too. Um, so thanks for coming and if you'd like to present. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. I'll just see if I can get my screen sharing quickly. Okay. Yes, looks like you're seeing that. Get my presentation up. Okay, so are you seeing my um, my PowerPoint? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, great. All right. So yes, thank you to the organizers for for inviting me. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, the Brian simulator. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure what the audience is going to be, so it's going to be a pretty um, outliney sort of a talk. Um, I haven't unfortunately had time to do a timed run of this so I'll, I think it might run a bit short but that's great because it means that there's more time for questions which is the most interesting thing anyway probably yeah and just to clarify we're seeing your Jupyter notebook right now you so you're not seeing my PowerPoint no, no. Notebook. Oh, okay that's a problem um, because we should be seeing the PowerPoint okay let's try that again so I tried to share screen, which should normally show the PowerPoint. This is what happens when you don't make it to the uh, test run. Okay, I see, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna close the current share. Oh, there yep. you go. I'm gonna try resharing the, the screen and hopefully that will get the PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, great, good. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay. So um, what is what is Brian, um, for, for people who don't know? Well, it's a simulator for spiking neural networks. And um, there's a few things that we focus on. Um, so we focus, one of the main focuses is that it should be easy to learn and use. Um, and that was one of the main things that I wanted to do when I started writing Brian was uh, was to make something um, that, that when I was a beginner in neuroscience that uh, that would have been easier for me to, to, to get into. Um, so for example, we now have uh, a one line install. Um, that's all you need if you've got uh, a Conda distribution of Python installed. That's how you install Brian. We've got uh, a lovely uh, documentation. Oh, I say it's lovely, I hope so. Um, it's got uh, tutorials, it's got examples, it's got a user guide that you can read through, it's got reference information. Okay, so it's also got a very nice syntax. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of Brian in, in a minute. Um, the other main interest was in having flexibility. And what I mean by flexibility is that it should be possible to easily come up with new models that haven't been previously invented. Um, for me, that's the point of research, right? You you try out stuff that hasn't previously been considered. Um, and we wanted a tool that, that can support that. And again, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, 
the, what I'm going to do in a minute is have a demo, which is actually this here. Um, you can actually load up this URL right now. Um, and if uh, if the binder um, page is running, you can actually try try running this demo um, while I give this talk, in fact. OK. So our, our other big thing was about flexibility. We want, we want to be able to define new models. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. Performance is, of course, also important. I'll talk about that a bit more later. But the important thing for us is that performance is less important than that it be easy to learn and use and that it be flexible. Um, and the reason for that is basically, suppose that you're starting a new project. Um, you decide you want to do spiking neural networks. We, um, we might take six months to learn the tool and then one or two hours to run the simulation because it's a very efficient simulator. Or we take one month to learn the tool and it takes four hours to run the simulation. I think it's obvious that in that situation, the, the, the better option um, is that it takes one month to, uh, to, to learn at all and, uh, and a bit longer to run the simulation. So that was, that was our thinking here is that ease of, ease of use, flexibility, things like that are more important in many cases than performance. But of course, performance is, is also an important consideration. I'll get back to that later. Uh, and finally, reliability. So I think now, probably like every simulator, every every package, we've got our extensive test suite. We've had many users using it for many years. Um, we we, uh, we we now know that Brian is is pretty reliable. We hardly ever get bug reports these days anymore, um, and and they're rarely in in anything that actually would change results. Okay, so I'm going to try and do a live demo now. And I think that uh, there's no chance that this will go wrong. So, uh, so let's see how that happens. All right. Okay. Can you quickly tell me if you're now seeing my Jupyter notebook or if you're yes. still seeing? You're seeing the Jupyter notebook. Brilliant. Okay. Good. All right. So, uh, so this is a Jupyter notebook. Again, for people who haven't seen this, basically a Jupyter notebook is it's running in the browser, but it has a uh, Python kernel running in the background. Uh, that is actually going to be doing computations. You can mix um, images, text, equations, things like that with code. Um, and then you can see the results down here. OK. So I'll just quickly talk through um, this, just as a simple example, um, and, and, and how it Im implements some of the things that I mentioned before. So in this case, we are going to have a simple model. And it's going to have n neurons on the left here. Um, and these neurons are going to be randomly connected to one output neuron. These neurons are going to produce uh, Poisson distributed spikes. You can see some of them over here with a time varying rate. Uh, and this is basically going to be a sort of leaky integrate and fire neuron. And you can see the, the output of that over here. I'll, I'll talk about that through a bit more in a moment. Um, all right. So specifically, um, the source neurons um, are going to have five Poisson spikes with a rate that is this function here, r max times one plus sine two pi ft over t over two. So it's basically a sin sinusoidally modulated time varying rate. Um, and we're going to connect those with a probability p of each neuron being connected. Uh, each synapse has a fixed weight w, and we have a sort of leaky integrate and fire neuron on the output, which has these two differential equations. So um, you have dv by dt as is, is minus, minus v is the membrane potential. But we're also going to do something a little bit unusual to demonstrate the point that it's very flexible, that you can, uh, that you can implement new models quite easily. So in this case, I'm going to say um, that we have a threshold, vt, which decays back to 1 with a time constant tau t. Um, and each time v crosses vt, so it doesn't have a fixed threshold, right? This, this vt can itself vary. Uh, the neuron will spike, V will be reset to zero, and VT increases a little bit. Okay, so it pr produces a sort of adaptation. And I can, I can show you that over here. So you can see that um, the orange curve is the threshold uh, variable, and the blue is the uh, membrane potential. And when the membrane potential crosses the orange curve, it resets to zero, and the orange curve jumps up, making it more difficult to reach a spike for the next time, except that after a while, that decays back to 1 exponentially. OK, so that's a very simple sort of model of, uh, of adaptation in a leaky integrated environment. OK, so how do we so the, a lot of these things, there's, there's nothing built into Brian to let you do that. There, this, 
function is something I chose. I could have chose something different. These differential equations are something I just picked. Again, I could pick something different. All of this is uh, is nothing that is built into Brian in any sense. So um, the way you implement this is something like this. You create a group of neurons, n neurons, and you just write as a string what the rate should be. So you can write a number here. So rates could just be a fixed number. It could be 100 hertz or something like that, right? But you can also write in a string. And this string, I could write in anything I like. Uh, any coherent mathematical expression, I can just write in here. Next, I define the equations. And again, these are just differential equations. So I just write them in a sort of fairly standard form. We've got, uh, so you can see here, that's a, a sort of standard dv by dt is minus v divided by tau. The only slight oddity here is this bit on the right, which gives you the units that the variable v being defined is in. So uh, here I've, I've decided not to use units for simplicity, but I could have written volt here. So that would say that v was in volts. OK. Um, all right. So then I create the output neuron. There's only one of those. But the differential equations are this string here. Um, the threshold condition is that v crosses vt, as I said before. And when it resets, v is reset to 0. And then vt is increased by this factor delta t. Uh, we set vt to be 1 to start with, rather than 0 by default. And then we create synapses from um, these Poisson firing neurons to this output neuron. And we define what happens when a neuron spikes like this. We say that on a presynaptic spike, uh, we increase the value of v by a constant w. OK, so v plus equals w. And again, I can write whatever I like here. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. There's no fixed idea that synapses have to create a sort of delta function increase like this. And finally, we actually create the actual synapses. That's the sort of definition of the synapses by saying we connect it with probability. OK, um, so the actual source code is here. This is made. Uh, this is a bit more complicated than what I just showed you here because it's got that bit in it, but it's also got some code to set the parameters and, and to make this little pretty uh, um, IPython widget thing here. Um, by the way, if you haven't, haven't, haven't used Jupyter Notebooks before, this is, a, I think, a really cool thing that you can uh, do with them um, when exploring a model. Uh, you can very easily, I mean, this is this is the code this is the code here for that interface. I mean, it's a bit ugly, but it's not very complicated, I think. Um, and then it just very quickly interactively uh, can be used to explore how a model is working. So I want to increase the number of source neurons, say. So I've just increased that from twenty to one hundred. We have a few seconds for it to simulate that. Um, but um, and there we go. Now it's run it again with one hundred neurons. Okay, uh, and maybe I want to change the um, the strength of the adaptation, so I can boost that up a bit. That's how much it jumps up after each spike. So then we get slightly fewer output spikes. Again, give that a moment. And then there you go. OK, so I think that's a nice a nice tool for uh, it's, it's not something that's built into brand. I just I like to show off because it's cool. All right, so right. So I wanted to talk about some of the ways um, that, that Brian is sort of like flexible and easy to use here. So for example, I said here that um, I don't have to use this function, right? This is nothing that's built into Brian, this r max times a half of 1 plus sine 2 pi of t. Um, let's say, suppose that I want to um, change this function. Now, instead of 2 pi of t, it's going to be 2 pi of t squared. Make sure I count the number of brackets correctly. And that should be good. So I've just slightly modified that expression. Uh, and now if I run this, it should fairly quickly uh, get a picture of that. There we go. You can't see it very clearly here. I think we need a few more neurons and to decrease the frequency a bit so that we can see that. OK, you can get to see it there a little bit, I think, when it updates. Yeah, so you can see that now. Now I'm, I'm basically squaring time, so you get a, a, a slow first modulation, and then they get faster and faster. OK, cool. Um, and we can do that with, with, with everything, right? So um, let's say I, I might want to uh, have weight squared for some reason. Yep, I can just write that in. Um, if I want to change the reset condition, so that instead of resetting v to 0, it resets to 
minus the threshold. I don't know. It's a completely meaningless thing to do, but why not, right? Just to demonstrate the point that it's that it's very easy to do that. Um, so I'll just run that again. You should see the effect of that in a second. Okay, so now you can see now that when it's resetting, um, it's instead of resetting to zero, it's resetting to, to the negative value of the threshold. Um, so there we go. It demonstrates the point there. Um, I should also say that we have this thing called Boisson group, but actually this isn't anything that is um, particularly substantial. Um, all that this is doing, it's a shorthand for um, an equivalent of this would be N. Uh, so it's a standard group of neurons with no differential equations defining it that has no variables. Uh, and it fires a spike if a randomly drawn integer is less than um, this rate function times dt. Okay, so this is actually exactly equivalent um, to the code above. So we inc included this thing, Poisson group, because it's sort of nice to have. Um, but uh, but it's just a bit of uh, syntactic sugar for for doing the same thing. So that's sort of demonstrated that this way of doing things is is sort of very flexible. Um, just run that just to demonstrate the point there. So there we go. You can see it's doing exactly the same thing. All right. Um, and what what else? I, I I could briefly say something like oh okay, so. I mean, I'm only giving you a very limited taste of, of, of what you can do here with Brian. Um, but just as a, another example here, um, I could specify a condition for two neurons to be connected. So I can specify a condition with a probability plus some additional Boolean condition that's going to be um, written here as a string. And I'm going to say that I, I in this, in this string is interpreted as meaning the index of the source neuron. Um, has to be less than the number of uh, presynaptic neurons divided by two. Okay, just um, just to demonstrate the, the point, but I, I can just write something in here mathematically. It's what I think of when I'm writing about my model in the paper. Right, this is th th these sorts of things are, the, are what you'd write in your methods section, and you can pretty much just translate them directly into code like this. And so now you can see that it's only taking um, only the first half of the neurons are being connected. I'll um, probably see that clearer if I increase the number of neurons there. There you go. See, it's only taking, uh, it's only allowing synapses from the first half of the neurons. Okay. All right. So, uh, at the questions, I can I can come back to this example and, and, and show you a bit more if you want. But uh, that was just to sort of give a taste of what Brian code looks like, uh, and and some of the advantages of that flexibility. Okay, I'm going to go back to my, to my slideshow now. So amazingly, the live demo did actually work as far as I as far as I know. Okay, so let's get on to uh, talking a little bit about performance. So, like I said, it's not the main concern of Brian performance, but actually, I think we do reasonably well. And the way that we do well is we use this idea of runtime code generation. So, one of the nice things about having users input their model as strings is we can manipulate those strings um, and in particular we manipulate those strings to generate code that's in c plus plus and then we call out to a compiler we run that code and we pull the results back into uh, back into python so every time you're using brian it looks like you're writing stuff in in python but actually it's generating stuff in c plus plus running that and so therefore it should be efficient um, and indeed, here, this is a, an example from our, our recent eLife paper on Brian 2. Um, you can see, basically, that it's it's doing pretty well. Um, it's uh, comparable to um, the performance of um, pure C++ simulators like Nest and Neuron, um, some, in some cases slower, in some cases faster. But, uh, but I'll, get, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, but the point is that. It's, it's not looking terrible on this from this point of view. Uh, and uh, yeah, OK. Um, so one of the nice things about this code generation approach that I wanted to talk about is that it allows us to automatically specialize the code specifically for the model that you're simulating. Um, so in fact, in this example here, 
uh, we've got two types of models. The network is the same. In fact, the behavior is entirely the same in these two models. Um, but in one, the model is defined to be heterogeneous. All of the neuron parameters uh, can be different. So each neuron can have a different time constant and so on and so forth. Uh, and in the left-hand one, we've said that all of the neurons, well, they can have different weights and so forth, they can have different membrane potentials, but the underlying parameters are all identical. Um, yeah, uh, so this is, I'm calling the, the homogeneous one. And when that's the case, you can do some specific optimizations that allow you to write code that is more efficient than for this general heterogeneous case. Um, and so let's let's just compare to uh, a couple of other simulators to demonstrate this point here. So if we think about the heterogeneous one, um, if we run the same code in Nest, um, and I'm going to say stuff about Nest here, that probably some of the Nest developers in the, in the audience are going to tell me it's wrong, but hopefully it's correct. Um, because this model has to be general enough that people can do all the things that they want to do with it, it's defined as the heterogeneous version of the model. So every neuron can have a different time constant, for example, because somebody might want to do that. And you only write a single bit of C++ code for the model, and therefore it has to be the case that it allows for the possibility that every neuron is, has different parameters associated with it. When we make Brian do the same thing, we can see that the performance of uh, Brian and Nest is about the same. So that's this uh, light green curve here, and this dark blue curve here is for Nest. So, Brian is a bit slower with smaller number of neurons and in this particular example a little bit faster for a large number of neurons um, but this is basically a not very meaningful uh, difference uh, it's basically I mean you know for other models nest will be faster for faster for a higher number of neurons and whatever so it, it, I, I'm not saying here that um, that this is showing that the Brian is faster than nest um, it's a little bit faster for a large number of neurons um, and similarly for neuron, I mean, neuron is, does seem to be a little bit slower here. Okay, but now we go to the homogeneous one, right? So we're, we can do a specific optimization that means we have to do less work. Um, if we know that all of the neurons share the same underlying parameter, the code to simulate that is, is much simpler and can run much faster. Um, but because nest and neuron don't have that, these curves, the blue and the uh, and the orange curves for nest and neuron are identical over here, but the Brian curves, that's the green ones, uh, have now got a lot faster. Um, and because of this, in this homogeneous case, uh, Brian is now running about 12 times faster than nest. Um, and it's even doing that only using a single thread, um, whereas, uh, whereas nest here is using uh, 12 threads to do that. Um, and, and 27 times faster than neuron. So the, the point is that uh, the, the code generation approach lets you do some cool stuff like this. Um, and, and I can talk about why uh, it makes such a difference and why uh, threads doesn't matter here uh, in questions if anyone's interested. In that. So another thing you can do with um, code generation is you can start uh, doing more unusual stuff like, for example, generating code that runs on a GPU instead of a CPU. Um, and so I've just tried to briefly talk about uh, a project Brian to Gen, which is, uh, which is about that. Um, so Gen is a GPU simulator for spiking neural networks written by someone, uh, another group, a group of Thomas and Watney in, uh, in Sussex. He's one of the uh, CNS organizers, so you might have a person. Um, and Together with him, we wrote a package called Brian to Gen, which basically means that you write your code in, in Brian, um, and it will run it on Gen, uh, on a GPU, using Gen as the computational backend. So the syntax from the user point of view is exactly the same as if you were using Brian, but instead of running uh, Brian's code, it runs Gen's code in the backend. So from the user point of view, you get this by simply adding these two lines to the top of your script. You write import Brian to Gen and set the device to be Gen. And we handle all of, all of the back end that then makes that work. And, uh, and Gen is pretty nice. Uh, it's been getting steadily better and better and better. It's been around for a while now, and uh, it keeps getting better. And in fact, I think the, the figures that I'm just about to show you are probably look even better now, because I think that they've got some significant speed ups uh, recently. But um, even when we did this paper, when, and I think we wrote it uh, quite a while ago, even though it says 2020, it was written a long time before that. 
uh, we get speed ups in some cases of up to 400 times faster on GPU than on a single CPU. So it can be a, it can be a pretty powerful thing. Now, unfortunately, Gen doesn't support quite as much of the flexibility that Brian does. Um, but a lot of what you would want to do in Brian will also be uh, would also be supported in Gen. Uh, and again, they uh, continue to improve the capacities of Gen, uh, and so that's getting more and more over time. Okay. So uh, I guess finally, I should probably also talk about limitations to try and be a little bit humble. So the, the first major limitation that I'll mention is that Brian is really designed to run on a single machine. So we don't have any support for distributing uh, a simulation across multiple, uh, across multiple computers over a network. Um, if you want to do that, I think you have to use Nest, uh, which is it's very much designed with that in mind. Um, However, from my point of view, I think that there's plenty of work, possibly decades of work left in, in trying to understand small networks. And by small, I don't mean very small. I mean, I've run uh, simulations in Brian with, with uh, millions of neurons, and it's, it's not a problem. You can run that on a single computer, OK? Um, so I mean, I, I, I don't know if I can understand a network of 100 neurons yet. So I'm not worrying too much about networks of billions of neurons, although obviously at some point we'll, we'll want to be interested in that. Uh, and the other part is uh, that we are, our focus is on single compartment neurons. So I should say that we do have some support for multi-compartment neurons. So uh, you can see this example here on the right. Um, here is a multi-compartmental neuron. Uh, and to load that into Brian and, and simulate it is, is as simple as that. It's not too horribly complicated. Um, you get the morphology from this file and create a, a neuron from that morphology. Um, so you can certainly work with multi-compartmental neurons. Uh, they're not um, horribly inefficient. Um, we use the same algorithms to uh, numerically integrate them as a neuron does. Um, so it's fairly efficient. I haven't done a direct comparison. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that plays out. But in any case, if your main focus is on multi-compartmental neurons, neuron is the, uh, or one of the others, is, is, is the more developed tool and would make more sense. But for simple things, like for some simple things, if you wanted to uh, to quickly try some things out, you can certainly use um, single uh, multi-compartmental neurons with Brian. And this is one of the things that, that we're certainly um, actively developing. OK, um, I'd just finally like to say thank you to Marcel, who is the main developer of Brian these days, um, and Roma, who, who wrote uh, particularly the, the first version of Brian. Um, with me and, and still uh, participates on that. And also to, uh, to Thomas and uh, his team for writing GEM. I'd also like to thank this, uh, this large group down here. This is all the contributors to the Brian2 to, uh, to Brian to GitHub. And, uh, and of course, all of the users of Brian. And uh, with that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Great speak talk. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Can you see him or? Are you... uh, yes, I will just open that up in just a sec. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. Shall I? Uh, shall I go ahead and answer the top one or? Uh, I think that the very top one is for, from the discussion or. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Can, can you do? You, do you want to go ahead and read out the ones that are relevant then? In that case. Oh, uh, sure. At the bottom, um, one is from. Um, looks like from Charles. Um, in your comparison of runtime between Brian and Nest, did you compare homogeneous Brian to homogeneous Nest? Because there's an option in Nest to specify the parameters will be uh, homogeneous, but it required for modifications to the model. Okay, so so we looked for that. In fact, we even I think we emailed the the Nest developers and couldn't find uh, any way to do that. We would have been very happy to do so. Um, but I, I think when I, Marcel emailed the, the Nest people and asked them how they would do that, and the only way of doing it, possibly at that time, maybe it's changed, was to write new C++ code to create a new model. Um, so uh, I, I, I didn't know how to do that, and I uh, would be happy to do so. Um, so another question I had was mine. Uh, I, I had. Um, is there a good way, either a repository or, or like a message board, uh, if we uh, for sharing models and equations, um, and like if we have our own published models, 
Um, is there a process which you can use to actually integrate it into the um, uh, uh, like Brian source code uh, so that other people can readily use our models without having to you know, retype out the entire equations from hand every time? Yeah, so this is uh, this is a controversial point. Our, our take on, on this uh, was that uh, th there have been some, some problems um, in, in the literature of people using other, modifying other people's models without really understanding the way that they work. Um, and, and so, for example, there was a, an interesting paper from Tim Bogles recently, which showed, uh, which went through, um, I think it was model DB and a whole bunch of models that claimed to be models of the same um, types of channels or whatever. Um, but had enormously different dynamics. And they, they sort of went through and did this systematically. Um, and so our, so our sort of take on this is that if you have to write the model yourself, um, you have to sort of kind of understand what it's doing. And it'll be less likely that you run into those sort of problems. So that was why, for example, we didn't. So we had this actually in Brian 1. We had named models that you could use where you didn't get to see the um, what the equations that were defining it actually were, um, but just used them straight off. But we we actually thought that this was more problematic than basically if you want to use a model, look up the equations, type them in. It's not that much work to type in some equations. And while you're doing that, you might realize that you don't really fully understand uh, what they're doing. Um, and, and so the idea is that um, you, you you lose a bit of time potentially in typing out some equations, but you potentially gain a lot of time in that you don't um, write something that you don't understand, uh, generate models that, that you can't really understand well and, and, and cause lots of problems down the line. Um, but but that maybe that's a slightly controversial point, and I'm sure that many people will, will disagree with it. Um, however, I think we sh I think we certainly should be sharing models. Um, Thomas says there's also copy and paste. Yes, quite. Uh, you should certainly be uh, sharing models. I think that's very important. Um, and, and I think in a, mo in a fully reproducible way, if possible. Um, so I, I think probably using GitHub or um, putting them on ModelDB makes sense for that. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that, that we need anything more than that. Um, we did think about having a, a sort of Brian 2 cookbook which would be like a, a wiki page or something like that with a bunch of standard models that you could copy and paste. But it, it felt not in the spirit of the, the decision that we've made about uh, not allowing named models. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, very welcome. I think we uh, the next talk is from um, um, oh, Sorry, I think I got kicked. Uh, so, um, a little technical difficulty there. Uh, next talk, um, it's going to be, I believe this is a shared talk, right? Between uh, Leah Eggleston and Robert McDougall. Uh, Correct. They're talking about uh, the neuron simulator, and I will let them get to it. And Kale, I'm going to have to take you off stage so that they can share the screen. One sec. All right, still, still not letting me share. Should be OK now. Sorry, it took me a second to figure out how to unmute. All right. Well, that's going to annoy me. All right, so thank you so much. Um, so here, for example, uh, I'm going to talk about Neuron. These are a couple of uh, figures from our tutorial the other day. Uh, so we'll start with a brief overview of the Neuron Simulator, talk about some resources for those who want to learn more, and then we'll talk about some things that are relatively new or coming soon in the 8.0 release, hopefully later this summer, and we'll end with a preview of a longer-term effort. So Neuron, whose homepage is neuron.yale.edu, 
is a general tool for simulating neurons and networks of neurons, covering both the mechanisms directly underlying action potentials and the chemical and protein kinetics that happen inside and outside the cell. Neuron is especially focused on models involving biophysically detailed cells with morphologies and ion channels, but more abstract models like Zikavich or just straight up uh, integrating fire also run well. And of course, these different scales can be combined. As a group, we've collaborated with HBC as a group, we've collaborated with HPC experts at EPFL for over a decade. As a result of this collaboration, Neuron robustly scales from working on a single core on your desktop to, I don't even know, I know it's been run up to at least 128,000 cores. If you do need to run such large network simulations, your university probably has an HPC environment you can use with Neuron. But if not, Neuron was one of the first tools to be supported on the Neuroscience Gateway which provides free HPC access for computational neuroscience. For your non-HPC modeling needs, if you're running on Mac, Linux, or in Google Colab, Neuron installs in seconds with a simple pip install Neuron. Uh, prefix this with an exclamation mark for Colab, of course. And by the way, if you don't know uh, Google Colab, it's a free Jupyter Notebook server. So Jupyter Notebooks are what uh, was just shown with Brian. So it's a free Go Jupyter Notebook server. Uh, it's what we used for the Neuron tutorial the other day, and I think it's a great tool for teaching in general. You should check it out. Anyways, on Windows, uh, we don't have an up-to-date pip install yet, but you can use the big blue button on the Neuron homepage. Uh, also with Windows, note that Python's not installed by default, so you're going to want to install a Python if you haven't already. Uh, any distribution should work, uh, but I personally use Anaconda. There's some other things that you can install. For example, you'll need MPI for certain large-scale parallel simulations, but this will give you a basic setup. And by the way, shout out to the EPFL crew for getting PIP to work. Uh, Neuron provides an extensive set of graphical tools for model construction, exploration, visualization, and analysis. These can be used alone or combined with scripting in Python, or everything can be done in Python. Give you a sense of how powerful this is, the 16 lines of code uh, on the left here is the complete code for describing a model, simulating it, running the simulation, and plotting the results that we see on the right. The only thing not shown here is the morphology file C91662. During the Neuron tutorial on Saturday, we live coded something almost identical to this with Google Colab. We're using an SWC morphology file directly from neuromorpho.org, and this all took just a few minutes. Uh, you can watch the tutorial video at tinyurl.com slash neuron dash CNS 2020. Uh, so I'm not going to go through this code, but I do want to point out the unit submodule introduced in Neuron 77. Uh, this provides scale factors for different units. Uh, now here, everything is expressed in Neuron's default units. So it just helps slightly with readability. So we can say we initialize negative 65 millivolts. But I know I, f I personally found it convenient when I wanted to incorporate a model of circadian protein oscillations from the literature, where some of the uh, rate constants in the paper were expressed in nanomolars per hour, for example, which is not neurons' usual units. Uh, so we're aware of over 2,300 publications. Uh, the full list is on, on the neuron website. We're aware of over 2,300 publications that include models built in Neuron. Source code for 737 of these are available on ModelDB, a discovery tool for computational neuroscience uh, that was just mentioned in the last talk, as modelDB.yale.edu. Uh, the screenshot here is from a development version. Uh, Ted Carnavale and Serena Thapoon can tell you more about ModelDB's present and future tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central European. In these 737 shared neuron models, you'll find a couple thousand ion channel implementations covering A currents, H currents, L currents, you name it. And you can easily modify these or create your own. Most are in a format known as mod files. Uh, we talked about this with Arbor. Uh, but we also, mod files also work with the Sonata format. Uh, but you can just as easily use channels described via NeuroML or uh, specify channel kinetics using an interactive graphical tool. To learn more about this or any other aspect of Neuron, check out our unified documentation at tinyurl.com slash neuron dash docs. This documentation, built automatically from GitHub via Travis CI and set up by Alex Savalescu from EPFL, combines the Neuron programmer's reference, tutorials, and internal documentation. 
You can also ask questions or read answers uh, to over 4,000 previous threads on the Neuron Forum. That's tinyurl.com slash neuron-forum. As I mentioned, there are over 700 neuron model codes corresponding to roughly an equal number of papers uh, available on ModelDB. tinyurl.com slash neuron-models will take you there. Uh, there are two official neuron courses almost every year, a uh, six-day intensive interactive experience in the summer and a one-day overview before SFN. More casual tutorials by neuron developers and others happen at various times. Uh, the course plans for 2020 got interrupted for obvious reasons. And we're still trying to figure out exactly what an online replacement might look like. But this past Saturday, we did a brief tutorial introducing both Neuron and NetPine. If you, if you missed it, you can check it out at tinyurl.com slash neuron-cns2020. Um, incidentally, if you're interested in getting involved with Neuron development, we'd love to have you. We held our first in-person hackathon last fall. That's not going to happen this year, but we do have monthly online developer meetings. The agenda is posted on GitHub, and the meetings are mostly public on Zoom. Uh, we do keep the Zoom link private to avoid Zoom bombers, but just shoot me an email for the uh, Zoom info. All right, so that's the overview. So now I just want to highlight a few recent developments with Neuron. Uh, so in collaboration with our friends at EPFL, we've put a lot of effort into trying to improve Neuron software engineering practices. We now do continuous integration uh, testing on all three main supported platforms and use continuous integration to keep the unified documentation page up to date. Each new release, uh, we test the models on model DB, make sure that everything continues to run. Uh, so we now have nightly automated, gener automatically generated development releases of the Neuron Python wheels for Linux and Mac and installers for Windows, uh, nightly installers for Windows. Uh, we've added developer documentation, a contributing guide, and, and generally we've made the development process much more public with greater use of GitHub issues, et cetera. From the analysis perspective, we're working on improving code introspection. This means that as of Neuron 8, uh, you can query mechanisms to get the code, file information, and uh, channel description. So like h.hh.file will give you the file, h.hh.code will give you the source code. Uh, more interestingly, things like H .8, help of h.hh will tell you sort of this description, which also appears here in model view. So uh, this is the description from the beginning of the mod file. Um, if you've got the nmodal module installed, pip install nmodal, you can query a channel mechanism for information about the ions involved. Uh, if you're a hardcore programmer, you want to do some manipulation, you can get an abstract syntax tree, so h.hh.ast gives you the abstract syntax tree. Uh, if you want to do manipulation on mechanism specification, or if you want to get the ontology specifications, h.hh.ontology uh, IDs will tell you which ontological concepts are represented by a given mod file. Uh, this, of course, assumes that the ontological concepts have been annotated using nmodal's represents keyword. Uh, this is new as of Neuron 7.7, so it's been around for a little bit, but not a lot of it. Um, here, for example, is the code from, uh, for the Hodgkin-Huxley kinetics taken straight from the uh, GitHub web page. Uh, so this model represents both a sodium channel and a potassium channel. Uh, the ion called Na represents uh, this ontological concept. This identifier, of course, maps to sodium. Um, so yeah, you should annotate your models. It's good practice. It helps other people understand uh, what they do and what they're representing. Otherwise, we're, of course, always interested in improving Neuron's performance. Uh, Neuron 7.7, we introduced just-in-time compilation for reaction diffusion kinetics and parallelized 3D intracellular simulations. Neuron 8.0 will launch with more seamless core neuron integration. If you're not familiar with it, core neuron is Neuron's optimizing engine that works with both GPU and CPU simulation. And Pramod's going to tell you all about this tomorrow at 12.30 Eastern, 6.30 Central European time. Uh, finally, for me, before I hand it over to Leah, we're also constantly improving the neuron interface. Uh, this is true for both the programming side, where reaction diffusions gained explicit support and long-standing neuron features like plot shape and distance calculations, and for the graphics side. Uh, plot shapes gain the ability to work with matplotlib and neuron 7.7 and with plotly and uh, 7.8 or 8.0. 7.8 is this thing that only exists in the pip install 8.0 is coming soon. 
Uh, Range Var Plot supports even more Python graphics libraries, and this is extremely important if you want to be able to do stuff with Google Colab to just be able to embrace Python's graphics capabilities, just to be able to embrace uh, everything and run it all in the Jupyter Notebook and still be able to have your neuron-specific graphs. We have an ongoing effort called Neuron GUI 2 uh, that's useful now and will hopefully one day replace Neuron's interviews-based graphics. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Leah Eggleston, who can tell us more. Hi. Hi. So, so let me get the Uh, it sounds like, actually, you might have to stop sharing your screen so that I can. There we go. All right, can everyone see that all right? Yes, Great. just not in full screen yet. There you go. Okay, perfect. So yeah. Uh, I would like to tell you all a little bit more about um, our updated interface that we've been working on for the past year, uh, rather creatively called Neuron GUI 2. So we had a couple of goals for this updated interface. Um, first, just in general, modernizing Neuron. Um, so providing this more modern look and feel, um, and also we have updated features and graphics and a newer HTML-based method for building a custom GUI um, but also we wanted to make sure that everything in the current interview system um, still works. So like complete backwards compatibility for the current GUI uh, to allow for an easy transition. So that means that the functionality is still going to be there for all the analysis tools and model construction and great things that are already available. And this is just a quick look on the left of what the interview system looks like for a simple console versus Neuron GUI 2 on the right um, with a browser-based system. So as an overview, Neuron GUI 2 is currently a Python package, and we intend to make it uh, pip installable at some point soon. Uh, the stack we're using Python with uh, WX for the uh, interface elements and CEF for embedded browsers. And uh, on the browser side, JavaScript with Plotly and 3JS for graphics and HTML. Uh, one new addition is that the Neuron GUI 2 starts out with a dedicated Python terminal using a WX Pi shell, and the interface windows are using embedded Chromium uh, or CEF browsers. And those can communicate both ways between Python and the browser. And so now if you're using Neuron GUI 2, Neuron will automatically redirect uh, original GUI commands uh, to Neuron GUI 2. So the original functions um, used in the interface uh, to construct basic panels and consoles and everything uh, custom will still continue to work. And in the new system, we use HTML data attributes to uh, sync the browser with neuron components on the Python side. So an example of just a basic functionality, what it looks like in Neuron GUI 2. So running scripts and loading and install morphologies, um, obviously running on a Mac, the important note here is just that uh, it acts like you would expect it to for a modern interface uh, with a regular file browser and using your operating system um, as you would expect it to. Uh, another feature transferred over, we have customizable uh, line graphs. In this case, we're using uh, Plotly.js so we can get all the great functions of Plotly with uh, uh, many widgets and interactivity that all works great. And the important part here is that on the HTML side, the way this works is that we can set, you can use very simple HTML constructions that will then uh, be used by Neuron GUI 2 to set up um, communication of changing variables and types of modules in both directions. So in this case, you see the HTML is just setting up, up a line plot and using data, data star variables, see so data and anything after that. In this case, X variables and Y variables are just set as strings. And then if you have anything that um, is not just an H ref variable, you can set it up in mappings when you create a new window. So for example, I want this simulation, I want this line plot to plot the simulation for uh, SOMA. So then I will set up 
seg mat to soma, middle segment. So yeah, these mappings can be used to sync any variable to the HTML, so it's very flexible. Um, you can obviously do whatever else you want with the HTML in that window. And when you're setting up uh, the interface size and custom menus for that window can also be set. And this is just another example of line graphs, in this case, two in the same window that would both run at the same time with di different variables plotted. Um, you can see in the second one, um, down on the bottom right, you can see that the Y variables, there's two plotted and they're just separated by a colon. So it's very simple to um, customize these and add in multiple elements and everything else is handled behind the scenes. And another very basic and important feature is the shape plot graph. Uh, this is what it looks like in Neuron GUI 2. Uh, we're using 3JS for the graphics. And as you see, um, internally, this is just set up as a shape plot type div. Um, and when it's loaded in Neuron GUI 2, it will just uh, be plotting whatever cell morphology is loaded. Uh, in this case, the important thing to note is that the new shape plot um, retains the interactivity, but it's a lot smoother and um, easier to handle than it is currently in interviews. And so importantly, like I was talking about at the beginning, we can still use uh, the original GUI commands and functions to set up your windows. So here's just an example of a simple uh, X panel uh, console where I've set up various uh, simple functionalities and tech boxes and um, simple layout. And you can see on the bottom right what it looks like in the HTML window. Um, so all of these are just translated into HTML from the redirected uh, original functions. So that means that this provides the backwards compatibility, which is important because of all the, all the tools that are already out there for the interfaces using these functions. So they would work um, the same way in Neuron Glue 2 uh, behind the scenes. So all of those would still uh, be compatible if this was a new interface. Uh, but you don't have to use the, the current or old syntax. You can also set up your own HTML, um, obviously doing whatever you might want to do with the HTML and then just using your data star variables um, and classes for plots and such to sync up with um, Neuron on the Python side. So this is just a quick example um, of a window where uh, you can see that I've set up, you know, a little bit of styling, um, do whatever you want with HTML, <laughs> go crazy. And then the important part to note here is on the bottom left, you see that the mappings take the Python variables that were set up in the console and map them to uh, strings that were used in the HTML. Um, and then the window can be setting up, set up with those mappings, um, a size, custom menus if you wanted them. So I'm gonna get out of this and hopefully try a quick demo. Okay, so we got this set up. The current window, so it will have interactivity from both sides. So uh, on the HTML side, say I've set my ic.amp. We can see what that is. And I set in the Python, uh, for example, the initial voltage and I can reset that and you can see that it changes immediately or for example i had a poke string in this which was such a creative name <laughs> and if i change that it will also show up um, so in this case i've just loaded in a short script that um, did what you saw in the console setting up the python variables setting up these mappings and then giving them to a window and this is pulled up immediately. So then it's synced to Neuron, it can run the simulation, keep track of reference variables, and there we go. And so this is all set up, this is loading in this HTML file in which I had, you know, a little bit of styling, CSS, you can do whatever you want. Um, this is set up how I want it, but whenever there is something that I want to keep track of, I use a data star variable, ic.delay. And because I, I set up a mapping for IC, this will get read in and updated um, from both sides automatically. So, there we go. 
So wrapping up, uh, we are hoping to have a preliminary version of this be public in about a month or so. But in the meantime, if you want, uh, if you want to ask us anything more about it or test it a little earlier, you can always contact us. Um, yeah, so any, any questions or features that you're concerned about or that you would like to see uh, while we're finishing this out? So it looks like there's one question in the q and I think, Robert, you may have seen it already. Yeah, so somebody asked about somebody uh, it looks like a Python issue. They were having trouble importing Plotly. Um, if you're using uh, Google Colab, it'll have a scientific development suite set up, so you don't have to uh, import it. You don't have to install anything. If you're using Anaconda or just your system Python, I don't believe it, it comes with Pyth uh, Plotly, but that's that's just a pip install. So pip install Plotly, and then you'll be able to uh, import Plotly. That, that, yeah, that's nothing to do with you no, know, that's just a Python issue. You can Google it if it doesn't work. Cool. Anybody have any other questions or feedback on some of the stuff that we're doing uh, with no and trying to make it more robust and more of a community project? I see a question from Kale just popped up. How does Neuron GUI 2 scale for large scale networks? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so far, we've just tested for um, a couple. So for uh, the line plots and shape plot. Um, and we're still working on the scaling for the shape plot, but it does scale, um, I think, linearly right now for the for a basic simulation. So, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, yeah, it's one... changing how how like the original how neuron is doing its simulation and scaling. That's still the same. It's just you know graphics might be different scaling. Yeah, I'm just gonna uh, basically re uh, reiterate what Ted says here. You probably don't want to use if you have, you know, if you have a model with forty thousand cells, having a plot shape of forty thousand cells is not a very useful concept because it's just a blur. Um, so you would you might want to look at an individual neuron separately, in which case the, you know there's no issue, but it doesn't you you probably don't want to do a large graphics of a large network. It's just not a useful concept in in practice. And all of the calculation is done with neuron. There's not this is strictly an interface issue. So you have the full speed and power. You can use neuron, you can use core neuron for the GPU based acceleration and things like that. Everything still works. Yep. Oh, so there was a question about uh, how the GUI elements work. So it is, it's, you're not, the important thing is that you're still running this as a desktop application. Um, this is not, you're not running this inside of a browser. It's not some tool that you go and you log into. Uh, it is running on your machine. The way that this is working structurally is that in, inside each window, there is an embedded uh, browser, just in the sense of a, there is an embedded thing that allows you to render HTML. And why do we go with HTML? Because there's a lot of people out there that know how to do HTML as opposed to like WX or QT, uh, but it's actually encapsulated inside of a WX widget, if, you, if that means anything to you. So you can still do all of that WX stuff. And Leah, you have a comment or? No, I was just like showing this to back that up. Like, so all the, the menus and everything are done through WX, um, but inside this, and this browser window is set up using this Chromium extension for Python. And then inside here is just the browser window set up with it. This is actually an increasingly common way of doing user interfaces. So if you know Slack, Slack is, basically a web app that's been thrown inside of a window. Um, if you know Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio Code is a web app that's been thrown inside of a window. Um, this seems to be, because of the wide familiarity with HTML, this seems like it might very well be the future. All right, well, if there's no further questions, thanks everybody uh, so much.
Yeah, thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Salva, Salva Dura, our host this morning. Um, I think he's just getting ready. Uh, are you ready to start? I think we can start a little few minutes early, if you don't mind, or should we wait? Sure. No, I, we can start. I'll share my screen. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. OK, so so thanks for the organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, NetPine, uh, which is a multi-scale modeling tool uh, that serves as a high-level interface to Neuron. So I'm going to start by explaining a bit the motivation to build this tool. And this came from an NIH grant where we had to build a model of motor cortex circuits. And when we started gathering the data, uh, it was very complicated data at many different scales, from the different cell types and morphologies and biophysics to connectivity at the dendritic scale, the circuit scale, and even long range inputs. So. Um, it seemed that we needed a method to kind of integrate all this experimental data and facilitate the building of the model. Of course, the, the neuron simulator enables building this kind of very large scale models. And we have seen examples from the Human Brain Project, the Allen Brain Institute. But they usually require some additional uh, Python framework to facilitate this process. Uh, so our motivation was to try to build this platform in a, um, using a declarative language. Uh, so the idea being that we can separate the biological parameters from the actual code implementation, the Python implementation. And so for a set of given biological parameters, we would have an underlying standardized implementation, which is curated and debugged, and we know that works well. And also having a standardized format will helps uh, to read existing models, interpret what the different parameters are doing, uh, helps to edit and share and reproduce the models. And that came very apparent when we try to uh, load models from ModelDB. It's sometimes hard to understand uh, what the different components are doing and to try to reproduce uh, the behavior seen in the models. So here's an example of a declarative language where you're essentially telling uh, what you want to obtain. So a population with a cert certain number of cells, as opposed to telling the simulator exactly step by step how to do it. The final motivation was to facilitate parallelization. So obviously this is possible in neuron, uh, but it requires a number of steps and some modifications in the code. Uh, you have to for example, distribute the different cells ac across different nodes and then gather back the information. So we wanted to make this uh, easier, as well as facilitate uh, the simulation of um, parallel simulations. Um, so running multiple parallel simulations, like a batch uh, parameter exploration, where we run multiple simulations with different parameter values. And we wanted to make this more automated and easier for the user. So we developed uh, NetPine, which stands for Networks Using Python and Neuron. And it's basically a Python package to facilitate the development stage, building the model, the parallel simulation, uh, parameter optimization as well, and analysis of biological neural networks uh, using as, uh, Neuron as the underlying backend simulator. So just to illustrate this again, we have Neuron as the sort of backend where we have some example code of how to create a synapse. Uh, NetPine builds on top of that, and we have this declarative language where we, for example, this connectivity rule, this would result in creating um, many, potentially thousands of connections. And we have also developed the NetPine GUI, where, which builds on top of NetPine and provides the same capabilities from uh, available in the declarative language, but using a graphical interface. 
And you can also uh, run the simulations and plot all the analysis from this graphical interface. So here is a general overview of the NetPine package. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but just to illustrate the different components. So the main component I would say is these high level specifications here on the left, where the user has to define the network model and using this declarative language, as well as the properties of the simulation, what we call simulation configuration, things like the duration, what things you wanna plot. We have some uh, facilities here uh, by enabling to import existing neuron models in either Hawk or Python, as well as NeurML cell models. So those are converted automatically into the NetPine format and users can uh, use the cell model directly in their network models. The second stage would be the network instantiation. So once you have defined the properties of the network that you want to build, you just uh, run this command that creates all the network itself, all the neuron objects for all the cells, the synapses uh, required to run the simulation. Uh, you can then run the simulations in parallel, which of course uses the neuron simulator. And once you get back the results from the simulation, you have a, a large array of different analysis functions built into NetPine uh, with common functions used in computational neuroscience from connectivity matrices to raster plot, voltage traces, LFPs, and information transfer functions, stuff like that. We also have a set of options to save the, the different components of the model, both the network, the high level parameters, the simulation output to different formats, pickle JSON, um, uh, MATLAB, HDF5, and to export to common standardized formats such as NeuroML and Sonata. So this is just a list of the components that can be defined in, in NetPine. So the basic uh, elements of any network, population, cells, synapses, stimulation coming into a network, connectivity rules, and the simulation configuration. Importantly, we have provided support for the molecular reaction diffusion component, the RxD component in Neuron. Uh, so this allows us to integrate this molecular level definition and incorporate or model processes uh, such as buffering, second messenger cas cascades, integrated using the same declarative language with the rest of the network uh, model. So you can specify where these processes are occurring, uh, for example, in different subsets of populations or in specific cells using the same declarative language and then run these simulations and observe these uh, molecular level phenomena and how they affect the network level for example, in terms of firing or plasticity. Uh, for connectivity also, we have uh, great flexibility. So we can define connectivity rules based on properties of the pre or post synaptic cells, such as the cell type or the location of the cell. We have different functions available like probabilistic, convergent, divergent. Um, and we also have uh, learning rules that can be used, including STDP and reinforcement learning as well as gap junctions. As mentioned before, NetPine takes care of the parallelization. So it takes care of distributing the different cells in the network across the different nodes that are available. And then once the simulation finishes, it gathers back all the information so that the user can analyze it on the master node. We have recently uh, been working with the Bluebrain project guys at EPFL, and they're doing fantastic work uh, with Core Neuron. And just a few days ago, they managed to run one of the NetPine N1 uh, motor cortex models using Core Neuron, uh, both on HPCs and on GPUs for the first time, and obtaining uh, pretty incredible uh, speed ups. Uh, I think they will mention more about this. They wanted to check their results before <laughs> making it public, but it's pretty impressive. Uh, the paper they published showed seven, uh, seven times speed ups, but I, from these results, it was even more. So they will present some of these results in core of core neuron tomorrow. The other big thing that I wanted to point out is uh, this feature in NetPine for parallelized parameter exploration. So 
it sort of facilitates the process of parameter exploration in networks. Um, so you can define, for example, uh, parameter sweeps. So you want to analyze the effect of certain parameters within a range of values. And you can just write a very simple Python script with the different parameter names, the values you want to explore, and uh, use sort of predefined configurable setups uh, that you can customize for different uh, machines. Like if you want to run in your own laptop, or if you want to run on different supercomputers with, for example, Slurm or PBS Torque, it's all, all sort of predefined. And you can just change a couple of lines to, to run the same uh, parameter exploration in these different systems. We have tested this because we are building several large network models. And so we've tested this on different clusters from our local university cluster to the NSF, Exit, uh, scientific shared clusters in Comet, for example, or Stampede. And more recently, we've moved to Google Cloud, where, of course, it has the advantage of providing more simultaneous cores. And we've actually reached a record uh, a few months ago where we ran these parameter explorations for one of the network models on 100,000 cores simultaneously. So this is uh, fantastic because we were, we were able to explore the effect of uh, different connectivity configurations in the network model, thousands of different parameter configurations in just a couple hours. Uh, this is just an example of the kind of representation you would get for these multidimensional parameter sweeps, where you can see the effect of these parameter values on, for example, the firing rate of a particular population. And NetPine also has uh, embedded the, the feature of running uh, evolutionary algorithms as another alternative method for parameter exploration. Uh, so this is an example of running these evolutionary or genetic algorithms on a network where we wanted to tune the different firing rates of different populations to some biological ranges. So I'm showing here just an example of the first candidate that we have in the first generation, which obviously most of the populations are not firing and some are epileptic. And the final solution where we get some reasonable firing rates and uh, dynamics. Again, this is automated. So you can just set the parameters of the evolutionary algorithm and NetBank will run all the simulations for you. And this is just an illustration of some of the analysis that you can do afterwards from the uh, evolutionary optimization results, where we run 68 generations, 50 candidates each. So we have like 3,400 simulations. And you can explore, for example, the resulting firing rate for each of the populations as a function of the fitness or the relation between the firing rate of two different populations. In terms of uh, analysis of single simulations, uh, NetPine, as I mentioned before, has a, a number of common analyses, uh, connectivity plots, uh, voltage traces. You can plot any of the uh, properties you record from currents to voltage. Uh, you have information analysis uh, such as Granger causality as well, which is not shown here. And uh, we have included as well a recording of local field potentials. So this uses the linear source approximation similar to LFI uh, by summing all the currents of all the segments of all the neurons as a function of the distance from the electrode to the different segments. And here we, I'm showing an example for a single cell as, as well as for a network. So you can place the electrodes at any arbitrary 3D location of your simulated network and then record the LFP signals. And then you can plot, of course, uh, things like the the spectrogram of each of the signals recorded. We have also recently added a calculation of the current source density to compare to many experimental data sets that are out there. And thanks to Erica Griffith, who implemented this feature recently. So now we are able to compare to, for example, uh, macaque data sets from collaborators that we are working with. The other big feature that I wanted to point out is the development of this uh, graphical interface, which essentially enables uh, to do all the features that you can do with NetPine programmatically, but from the GUI. So you can build the models, um, run the simulations in parallel, and analyze the results. 
So we are currently connecting uh, so we can allow the user to submit simulations in parallel to different um, supercomputers, such as using Neuroscience Gateway or to connect to your own Google Cloud account. So you can run simulations using your, your own credits. And uh, the GUI has been proven useful both for students and beginners, uh, which uh, allows them to learn the different components available in NetPy, so the different features that you can, you can add, the different uh, parameters for populations, for cells, et cetera. So it's a sort of a top-down approach where you can just visually see what is available to you. But also for advanced users, I, I, I think it's quite useful just to, for example, prototype new models when you're starting from scratch and you want to build something. It's quite quick and easy to use the GUI to build these models. And of course, you can, you can then uh, export whatever you create in the GUI. You can export to a Python script. So you can continue your, your model programmatically afterwards if you want to do more complicated stuff. And you can also use the, the GUI to explore existing models. So you can load any NetPine model into the GUI and just explore the different elements in the model or run the simulation and explore the, the simulation results graphically. Uh, a key feature, I think, is this interactive Jupyter notebook that we developed. And if I have time at the end, I'll show the GUI interactively. Uh, so the Jupyter notebook just opens here inside the GUI, and you have the ability to um, modify the parameters either from the GUI or from the graphical interface. And both of them are in sync, uh, by, by, by directional in, in sync all the time. So you can play around with either of the two modes. And it allows you to explore more in detail some of the parameters using the Jupyter notebook. So here is the link to the GUI. It's available right now at netpine.org slash GUI. You can go there, and you can load the tutorials that are available from the tutorials menu. And if you want a step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial with all the, uh, the guidance of how to run these different tutorials, you can go to bit.ly slash cns20 hyphen netpine. And here is the set of slides. I will also post later a link to the video recording from the tutorial, which was a couple of days ago. And that explains uh, how, to, how to use the GUI. So we are currently working with the Human Brain Project eBrains platform to integrate uh, both NetPine and the GUI within their new platform. So uh, this is also previously the brain simulation platform, and now it's turning into the eBrains or something like that. And so uh, NetPine will, will be available, so you can run it from their interactive Jupyter notebooks. Uh, but also, we're looking at integrating more closely the actual GUI within their platform. We've also been working on a similar approach with Open Source Brain, and this has been going on for uh, around six months now. So uh, NetPine is also available through Open Source Brain. And uh, the good thing is that we will then be able to integrate it with all the great features provided by OSB, including uh, file management, uh, access to the GitHub repos of different models, the larger database of models of available in OSB, and this new concept of having uh, workspaces where you can have your own files for your model or for experimental data, and you can um, go back and forward for uh, different days. You can go back to your workspace and continue working on your model. So as if you had your own private space on the cloud to work on models. So this is not yet available. What we hope to release it within the next three to six months, maybe. And you will also, of course, be able to run the simulations from OSB. And a nice feature is that OSB is also incorporating the or adding this NWB Explorer to visualize experimental data. And so both the NWB Explorer and the NetPine GUI will be uh, linked or interfaced through OSB. And so you would be able to visualize the output simulation data through the NWB Explorer and compare directly to experimental data, which I guess is one of the key things uh, we all models want to do at some point. So it should all be possible through the OSB platform. A uh, big shout out to Metacell, uh, which is the software company for neuroscience who has been developing 
the NetPine GUI, as well as OSB and the NWB Explorer. And they're doing a great job. Here's their website. And also mentioned, uh, NetPine is uh, compatible with Sonata and NeurML. So you can export from NetPine into NeurML, and you can import uh, models in Sonata and NeurML. So that we have recently published uh, a paper showing for example, using the same Sonata file descriptions for a model. Here on the left, we see the representation from the uh, Bluebrain project RT Neuron. And on the right-hand side from NetPine, using the same Sonata source files. And here running the simulation on the Allen Brain BMTK simulator and the NetPine simulator, again, using uh, the same source Sonata. Of course, this allows us to interface with other simulators such as BMTK, Nest, uh, or Pioneer ML. Uh, I would point out that the, uh, we have a website, netpine.org, with uh, a lot of documentation and step-by-step -step tutorials. Uh, our, the research scientist in the project, uh, Joe Graham, has been actually updating this documentation recently. And it's really comprehensive now and detailed. So any issues you can you can find on the web. We also have quest Q and A forums, uh, two of them on Google and on the Neuron Jail uh, forum. So if you have any questions, you can go here and post your questions or check the existing ones. And we have a publication on eLife that came out last year. If you want to know more details. Finally, I wanted to uh, mention that we already have many existing models that are being built in NetPine, and that's one of the, I think, advantages uh, of this tool. Uh, uh, we have a rapidly growing community, so there's a, that we know of, there are 70, 79 models that are being developed. Some of them are very close to publication. Uh, we've counted over 40 different labs that have used the tool. And you can find a full list here at netpine.org slash models. So we have models of thalamocortical networks, S1, V1, cerebellum, different phenomena like uh, disease like ischemia, stimulation, TDCS, for example, or epilepsy. So if you go to this list of models, you can find a particular model that interests you, and you can use it as a starting point. Most, Some of them have their repos link, repo links. And yes, I'll show just a couple of them as an uh, illustration. So this is the motor cortex microcircuits model that I've been working on for a couple of years. It's 10,000 neurons. Uh, it simulates sort of a column in M1. It has around 30 million synapses, and about 30% of the cells are uh, morphologically detailed. So we have able to we have been able to reproduce uh, a lot of in vivo results on firing rates. We, I'm not showing here, but uh, firing rates for different populations and also uh, oscillations, including phase amplitude coupling, which em emerged nicely from the network model. Another example is this collaboration we have with uh, Brown University, Stephanie Jones. Uh, she's developing the tool called the Human Neocortical Neurosolver. Uh, which aims to try to explain EEG and MEG signals using uh, the underlying biophysical circuit models. So they simulate a sort of somatosensory cortex column and then simulate the current dipoles in that circuit. And from that, they simulate the equivalent of the EEG signals. So the model was originally built directly in Neuron in uh, Hulk or Python. So we decided to convert it to NetPine to provide a bit more flexibility and also to facilitate scaling up the model, extending it potentially to other uh, regions of cortex, and also modifying and customizing parameters. Uh, we're also involved with them in developing the new graphical interface for their tool, which is, has some similarities with the NetPine tool, and it's also being developed by Metacell. And finally, I just wanted to mention uh, this example model, the Podgens and Disman thalamocortical model, which is quite popular and was mentioned also in the, in the Nest talk. Uh, so this is a column uh, with about 80,000 neurons. In this case, it's simplified point neurons and around 300 million synapses. 
Uh, so the model has been converted also previously into Brian. And here we converted it into NetPine slash neuron. And we've, able, we've been able to run the model on Google Cloud and reproduce the results of the original uh, Nest paper. So both in terms of uh, fine rates and different statistics. So we have a paper that is under review right now. And I can later post the link to the archive paper. So just wanted to finally say thanks to everyone involved in this project and to, of course, all our funding agencies. And I think I have a couple minutes. I'm just quickly going to show the, the GUI. Uh, do you see my screen with the GUI? Yes. So I just beforehand, I just loaded one of the tutorials, tutorial two, which shows a detailed cell network. And here we are seeing uh, the different uh, components that you can define in NetBank, uh, different cell types, populations, synapses, connectivity rules, uh, stimulation, and the simulation configuration. So if I just quickly go to one of the cell types, which we actually imported uh, from a hope file. So if I click on sections, I can see the list of sections available in this uh, model. If I click on one of these sections and I go to mechanisms, uh, I am able to see all the mechanisms inside. These are a couple of calcium channels, IH, potassium. And I can see here on the right-hand side the different parameters of these mechanisms, which I can just change the values right here. For the populations, I, uh, I see I have a population called excitatory E of the cell type. I can select my cell type here from the ones that I have previously defined. And I can select the number of cells that I want. And similarly for synapses, connectivity rules, they allow you to very flexibly define uh, how you want to connect the network. And I'm just going to go ahead and create the network, so instantiate this network from these high-level connectivity rules that I just defined. It is now creating the whole uh, network model, all the neuron objects underlying this network that are required for simulation. So it takes a bit of time, but not too much, because it's a multi-compartment model with about 700 compartments. Uh, and also the inhibitory cell type, it's also uh, morphologically detailed. That's a cell from, uh, from a different region. And it also has 400 compartments. So here we have the simulation. So I can zoom in and out. I can change the color of the cells just to make them more apparent. So it's very easy to navigate and visualize the morphologies of the cells. We can see here the, the apical tabs. We can zoom in into the somas. We see that there are four different cell types in different colors, two inhibitory, two excitatory. And Right now, I can just plot the connectivity matrix because we only, we haven't run the simulation. But I can click in this rocket here to simulate the network. It's currently running on a single core, but the idea is to, yeah, to be able to submit simulations to supercomputers. And so once the simulation completes, I should be able to use all these icons here in the left, plot different analysis functions, such as the raster, uh, voltage traces, statistics, uh, and if I had recorded LFP as well. So I think this should be relatively quick. Can just go back and check if there are any questions. OK, so while the simulation is running, I'm just going to go ahead and run and answer this question. So it says, uh, what type of parameters are you able to optimize using the parallel parameter searching functionality? Are you updating connectivity properties? Or can you also update the cell mechanics? Uh, thanks, Kate. So essentially, you can um, optimize any parameters you want. So you can, there's a way of telling NetPine which parameters you're interested in, and anything that is defined in NetPine from the molecular RxD if you had that component to the different cell properties, mechanisms, morphology, network connectivity, stimulation, 
anything can be selected as one of the parameters to optimize? Um, also, just to jump in, when you say parallel, um, you mean running parallel simulations, but can the simulations themselves be ones that would also be run parallel? Yeah, so it's parallel on top of parallel. Yeah, so we're parallelizing both the simulation, each individual simulation, as well as running many of these parallelized simulations in parallel. So for the example where I had, we were running on 100,000 cores, each simulation was running on 96 cores, and then we had 1,000 of them or 10,000 of them. So just to quickly show the simulation now completed, so I can plot, uh, for example, these cell traces here, uh, showing the voltage in the SOMA and in the dendrite. Oh no, sorry, the sum of voltage for two different cell types. So you can configure exactly what you want to plot in the in the previous screen. This I is the raster plot. Your... I'm sorry? You need to share your screen. Oh, okay. At some point it stopped. Share screen. Okay. So yes, yeah, so I was just showing the simulation completed. So I'm I'm able to plot the simulation results. So here you see the, the voltage traces and the raster plot. And I think we also have like some, the spike histogram and some power spectral density. Okay, uh, so let me see if there are any more questions. Uh, does it run a single cell in parallel? Uh, no, it doesn't. And that's the multi-split thing, which is not incorporated into NetBrain. And can we run our own instance of it, or do we need to use yours? So you, when you connect to the GUI online, you will have your own sort of cloud instance. Uh, right now, the latest GUI version is not set up so that you can download it to the desktop, but we are aiming to make it easy for you to connect to the uh, to the version online and to have enough power to simulate uh, using uh, Google Cloud. That's what we're using to host right now. And hopefully, with a single core is enough, and then you can submit large simulations to different uh, platforms. OK, so I think there are no more questions. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. If you have any questions, uh, please drop them in the chat, and I'll answer later. Thanks. Thank you, Salva. Great presentation. Uh, so we have one more presentation today. Um, Anton Arkhipov from the Allen Institute is going to be talking about some of the modeling tools and formats we're building. Uh, just Uh, it's 11.30, so Anton, uh, you can go ahead and share your screen and start. OK, great. Uh, yes, thank you, Kale. Let me start sharing my screen. OK. So you can see my presentation, and you can hear me well? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, so great to be here. Uh, very nice workshop. I really enjoy it. So thanks very much to the organizers, uh, Kale, Salva, and Porik, and to all the participants. Um, thanks to the Allen Institute communications team, who, who provided some support, and CNS volunteers. So great event. And uh, it's really nice to see this um, community, you know, here with all the different tools, uh, providing different possibilities and reinforcing each other. And I'm uh, very happy to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm Anton Archipov, an associate investigator at the Allen Institute in Seattle. Um, and uh, we are also working on modeling. Um, specifically, we uh, aim our efforts towards large-scale, biologically realistic modeling. And so today I'll tell you about the tools that we developed to do that work, uh, the Brain Modeling Toolkit, and the Sonata file format. 
And I also must say that uh, a lot of the work, especially the, the software engineer work um, uh, for the tools that I'm going to tell you about uh, has been done by Kale uh, here, uh, but also there were contributions from uh, many scientists at the Allen Institute. So the, um, the situation that we find ourselves in, so my team in particular, is that uh, we are embedded among experimentalists at the Allen Institute who are collecting a lot of data and sharing this data with the community. And these are high quality, uh, very sophisticated, very complex data. And uh, for me, for my team, and for many computational and modeling people out there, of course, uh, it's a real, a real excitement to be able to work with this data. And uh, at the same time, a huge challenge to try to incorporate them into our models uh, in a systematic way so as to really do justice to this data, to the complexity of the brain. So to give you some flavor of uh, what we have to deal with, uh, these are uh, examples of the major types of data that are available uh, from the Allen Institute. And of course, uh, other data are available from other organizations. And uh, in recent years, there's been really a revolution in the amounts and complexity of data coming, coming in. So we have cell type data, data where uh, um, we characterize electrophysiological properties of individual cells, uh, cell morphologies, transcriptomics. And uh, most recently, actually, we even have a data set where all three of those modalities are collected from the same cell using patch data dataset. So this is available at the Allen Cell Types database uh, here uh, at this link. And there is a lot of complexity of this data. Uh, there is, um, you know, there are multiple cell types uh, according to the recent counts in the mouse cortex alone. There are over 300 different cell types and it's probably really more based on just the transcriptomic uh, uh, modality. So um, that's, uh, that's sort of the composition, the building blocks of the brain, right? Then there is the connectivity. And I'm not sure what is more complex, cells and cell types or the connectivity or what is more important for models, probably both. And to some extent, they really define each other actually. But the connectivity data that we have at the Allen Institute, there are now at least three different modalities. So there is the whole brain mesoscale connectivity where uh, the connectivity is established in the whole brain between voxels, each voxel containing uh, probably thousands of neurons. Then there is the ultrastructural connectivity using electron microscopy. So this is just starting to appear. Uh, we have the first data set uh, for a layer 2-3 in a mouse V1 primary visual cortex. Uh, they've just been made available publicly. And these are incredibly complex data. So there, the resolution is nanometers. Uh, you can uh, see you know, neurons and their morphologies and spines and, and synapses in uh, intricate detail and um, eventually we'll be having a data set with a full cubic millimeter of mouse V1 available. Uh, so with about 100,000 neurons. So just from that data set, you will have a lot of neurons, a lot of uh, details about synapses and spines and whatnot, and uh, then connections, right? Which neurons are connected to which and where the synapses are uh, on those neuronal uh, morphologies. Then we have synaptic physiology data from multi-patch uh, experimental recordings in slice, which provide you not only the probability of connections between different cell types, but also the kinetic properties of synaptic connections, uh, the weight of synapse, uh, the short-term plasticity properties. So then uh, here on the right, we have recordings in vivo with optical physiology or electrophysiology using NeuroPixels probes. So this is a massive recordings we now have data for hundreds of thousands of neurons. And so again, just a lot of complexity and a lot of details and uh, our task. So for me, uh, and I think many people in the community would like to do that as well, is to integrate this data systematically into models uh, with uh, taking care of all this complexity. So this is illustrated here on this slide. Basically, what we want to do is to build this virtuous cycle between the uh, experiments and modeling. And of course, that has been achieved uh, in multiple instances. 
uh, for uh, different uh, modeling and theoretical and experimental types of work. But I would say probably hasn't been achieved yet at the scale uh, and the level of complexity that we are talking about here. To try to understand how all these different cell types come together to uh, produce activity and computation in brain circuits. And so, um, yeah, what we want to do is to take all this data, build the models, uh, simulate the models, make predictions based on those simulations, and then uh, design new experiments based on those predictions and repeat in such a self reinforcement uh, cycle. So, for that, of course, one needs tools, and there are great tools available in the community. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, there is space for improvement. And so, uh, for our requirements, basically, we need a tool that can work uniformly across multiple levels of resolution. Because sometimes you want to uh, do simulations at the biophysical level of details, and sometimes at point neuron level or at the level of uh, population statistics. And also, it uh, needs to be something that works um, for different size of systems, uh, something that you can run on a single workstation or on a cluster or ultimately in the cloud. So um, what we end up uh, producing, and uh, it's, it's available on GitHub freely shared with the community, is this tools that we, tool that we call the Brain Modeling Toolkit. So that's a Python-based software package for building, simulating, and analyzing large-scale network models. And uh, this uh, schematic illustrates its composition. So basically, BMTK, Brain Model and Toolkit, consists of two parts. There is a builder part and a simulator part. And so the builder can be used to build our uh, models. And a simulator allows one to run these uh, models, the simulations of those models, uh, uh, using uh, at, at different levels of resolution. And the key here is that uh, BMTK provides a more or less uh, unified, uniform uh, interface and user experience across these different levels of resolution. Uh, importantly, we are not reinventing the wheel here. We are taking advantage of existing great tools. So currently, the main ones are Neuron and Nest um, uh, that, that are widely used in the field. And of course, these are amazing tools. We are super grateful for, for them, for, for their existence. and. Um, Basically, what BMTK does is just provides an interface to those tools. The same idea like what uh, Salvador discussed for NetPine uh, now. <clears throat> uh, Neuron and Nest are amazing tools, but for some tasks, one really needs to, uh, to develop a lot of expertise to, uh, to run simulations and to run those simulations efficiently. Um, BMTK provides a uh, possibility to do it without really becoming an expert and uh, just uh, interface with the powerful simulation engine. So let's talk about the components one by one. And so the one component here is, is Network Builder. So that's a Python NPI API, which um, basically can be used across different types of networks, uh, different levels of resolution. It's the same interface. Uh, it allows for custom attributes and parameters. And uh, the main mode of operation here, and, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later, is that we generate our models and we send them into a file using this file format, Sonata. So the different steps uh, are, of course, creating the models, creating the nodes, uh, and pro providing some properties for them, then setting the connection rules, and eventually instantiating the network, instantiating the network and saving it to file. And the way how BMTK works is that we instantiate networks, uh, save them to file, then to run the simulation of that network, we uh, start the simulator, one of the simulator modules, and that reads in the files and performs the simulation, then outputs the results of the simulation in another set of files. So currently, we have four modules for running simulations. So there is this uh, Bionet module, which interfaces with Neuron for running biophysically detailed uh, compartmental simulations. Can also do point neuron simulations uh, because Neuron provides that capability. A point net module interface, interfaces with Nest uh, to run uh, point uh, neuron network simulations. Then we have this module uh, called PopNet, which interfaces with another tool previously developed at the Allen Institute called TPT. Uh, it's a tool to run population statistics uh, simulations. And then finally, uh, a module called FilterNet, 
And uh, this is the module that allows one to instantiate filters. Uh, currently, most of the functionality is, is for doing that in the visual space, but you know, one can easily modify them to run uh, with different types of inputs. And uh, these are filters that, that operate on some kind of input, for example, a movie, um, resulting in a time-dependent firing rate, which can be converted to spikes. And these spikes, uh, at least in our hands, the most common um, use here is to use the spikes as inputs to a more complex simulation, such as by physically detailed or point neural simulations. So um, for modules, and um, right, you can run simulations at different levels of resolution. Um, one thing that I must emphasize here is that BMTK will not give you the parameters for these different levels of resolution. So we absolutely cannot generate a graph, a connectivity graph, a single connectivity graph, and then run a simulation with that connectivity graph in Bionet for biophysically detailed version or in PointNet uh, with point neural version. However, uh, the synaptic weights, for example, that are necessary at these two different levels of resolution to obtain the same or similar results, that's not something that BMTK can provide to you. This is a scientific problem, and this requires, uh, you know, sometimes maybe it doesn't have a solution potentially. But uh, at least BMTK provides you this possibility. If you have an idea about what kind of, uh, let's say, synaptic weights you want to use, if you provide that, then it can run a simulation for you at these different levels of resolution. So just to make uh, clear that there is this distinction. All right, so this is the tool for building and simulating uh, models. Now, as we were working on that, there were a number of concerns and opportunities coming up, and eventually we teamed up with, uh, with other colleagues to take care of those concerns and opportunities. And uh, first we started working together with uh, the Blue Brain project, and then later on um, uh, joined works more with Open Source Brain and UML and NetPine and Pine and Neurodata without borders um, uh, groups. And so uh, many of them are here in this workshop. And uh, we ended up developing this file format that supports the types of modeling that I'm talking about. So our goal is, is to develop large detailed and uh, highly sophisticated networks uh, for simulations, right? Now, let's talk about this um, idea of uh, using instantiated networks. This is important for us. Um, in many cases, and this is, this is perfectly fine, this is an important way of uh, applying the models, uh, what happens uh, in the field is that a user would generate a model, would, would build a model, maybe with just a few lines of code, right? And then immediately run a simulation. And if you want to rerun the simulation, you just regenerate that same model with the same random seeds and that works fine this is great uh, unless you are working with very very large and complex models with you know hundreds of thousand neurons maybe millions of neurons billions of synapses and very complex connectivity rules in particular you know in some of our applications uh, for some of our models uh, building a model takes days it takes days. So if you want to run thousands of simulations with those models, you are not going to rebuild the model every single time. And I'm sure more and more people are becoming familiar with this problem. It's certainly something that the Blue Brain uh, project is, uh, is, is dealing with. But because of that, the main mode of operation for us is to separate these stages. Building is its own stage. It can take a lot of computational power. But then once it's done, we save it to a file or to a series of files and a simulation is a separate stage. So that's the philosophy behind BMTK and also behind this um, uh, file format Sonata that supports that. And another, another aspect of it is that by divorcing the model from the software, uh, just having a model as a set of files, we make it available for sharing potentially between different pieces of software, right? So maybe you don't want to use uh, BMTK to run your simulation or, or uh, to run a simulation of our model, of the, the model that we developed. Maybe you want to use NetPy for that. So you can actually do that. So yeah, like I said, we teamed up with these different groups and very grateful for that collaboration. We recently published a paper about the Sonata file format and um, looking forward for more interactions and um, broader in the field. So Sonata stands for Scalable Open Network Architecture Template. 
it's a desktop format. And um, the goals were to uh, create an efficient and open format for sharing models, simulation parameters, and simulation results. Uh, it's mostly focused on heterogeneous and fully instantiated networks, as I said. And um, it has um, some reserved uh, values and uh, descriptions uh, so that it can be reliably instantiated in some popular simulation tools such as Neuron and Nest, but it also has uh, abstraction that's sufficient um, to translate to other tools. Very importantly, I want to emphasize this. This is not a replacement for other formats. The whole point of developing Sonata was that we, we couldn't find a solution for this complex problem that we had, despite really wonderful formats already existing. So there are formats that allow you uh, to describe a lot of aspects of models. There are also formats that allowed you to do that uh, very computationally efficiently. Uh, but typically for particular aspects of the model or simulation output. So what we try to do here is to put it all together, where uh, a single format can describe all aspects of models and simulations, and also do that as efficiently as possible, um, you know, taking advantage of binary representations, so as to limit the footprint on the hard drive and, um, you know, make it efficient for computational, uh, for parallel computations. So, and we, we were not trying to reinvent the wheels, uh, the, or the wheel. in, in a case where uh, uh, a good representation was available, uh, Sonata is actually compatible with that. So for NeuroML, Sonata uses some portions of NeuroML to define properties of cells. We use SWC to uh, define morphologies. You can use Hawk, um, a model. Um, it's now compatible with NWB via converter. And so now let me tell you a few words about uh, what, what is there in Sonata. So basically, if you think about a network simulation, uh, there are three major components to it. Uh, there is the model itself, a network that can consist of some populations of nodes connected by edges. Then there is a simulation and parameters associated with how you want to run a simulation. And then there is a simulation output. And so in Sonata, we take care of all three uh, components of that. For the network representation, uh, there are nodes that are stored in uh, CSV and HDF5, file, HDF5 files, and edges that are also stored in, in, in similar files. And then those files uh, point to uh, reused morphologies and parameters uh, using representations uh, such as NeuroML, JSON, or and model. Then for the simulation parameters and metadata, we use JSON, uh, where we store uh, values such as, for example, the duration of simulation. And then for the output, we again use HDF5, uh, where we store spikes and different time series. So, you know, uh, we cover a lot of the bases here. And the key is that the most, uh, the most computationally and memory consuming portions of the model and, and, uh, and output are stored in an uh, efficient bi binary representation. So this is uh, uh, something that Salvador also just mentioned in the previous talk. So um, Sonata already, because of all these collaborations, has uh, pretty broad support and um, implementation. So there are at least two libraries that uh, allow for reading and writing Sonata. Sonata supported by us and Leap Sonata from Blue Blade Brain projects uh, working with C and Python. Uh, there are multiple pieces of software that can uh, understand or write Sonata in some way or form. So, BMTK, our tool, and then NetPine and Pine and NeuroML Lite can produce Sonata network structures. NetPine, BMTK, Pine, NeuroML, and Pine can produce simulation output in Sonata format. And then uh, there are additional tools uh, that can be used for, for example, for visualization. So like Actineuron can read in some other files and produce visualizations. Um, so that is all there. Uh, it's a working format that's pretty efficient, uh, but it's also an evolving format. And we really uh, invite uh, the community to use it, to give feedback and to contribute. Uh, it's an open source project on GitHub and uh, we really welcome um, additional applications questions and uh, further development. 
Um, so to finish this off, I just mentioned that uh, we have been doing a lot of work using these tools, so Sonata and BMTK, to build models um, integrating the complexity of biological data that I alluded to in the beginning of the talk. And those models um, that we finished are now available online. Uh, so uh, there is a, an older uh, model with just the layer four of mouse primary visual cortex or area V1. The latest model has all the cortical uh, layers in V1. It's over 200,000 cells. Uh, it has a biophysically detailed version and a point neuron version. And uh, you know we, we just recently published a paper where we uh, describe the model building and simulations with this model where we uh, were able to reproduce a number of experimental observations uh, from visual physiology recordings and also make some predictions about structure function relationships. And so these models uh, were built with BMTK, were simulated with BMTK and they're available to the community on these um, links uh, where you can download them in Sonata format. And uh, maybe if you don't want to use BMTK, you can try to use another tool that supports some other format to run the simulations and you know to use these models for your own projects uh, to improve them and to make further predictions from them. So I think I'll stop now and uh, take questions. And um, thank you again for your attention. And um, thanks to our founder uh, for creating the space for us to do all this work. Thank you, Anton. Do we have any questions? Anton, can you see them? Or... Uh, yeah, I'm getting there. Uh, one other thing, um, uh, just to mention uh, about the uh, cortical models. Anton, you have a, another workshop today um, yeah. in 1.30, the uh, West Coast time, which I think so. Um, in about an hour and a half. So if you guys want to also check that out, I recommend you do that. Uh, oh, that's right. The, the, the timing actually is not quite that clear. It's um, that workshop is uh, finishing for today, but tomorrow oh. and then tomorrow there is uh, the, the, there are additional sessions from 8 to 12 uh, Pacific time. Actually, tomorrow I'll be talking about the, uh, the models that we developed and the science of that. Okay, so yeah, I see a question here. I heard somewhere that BBP is not longer actively developed in Leap Sonata. I hope you can tell me this is not the case. Um, I hope that is not the case. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that's probably questions more for um, for the blue brain. Uh, but um, whether with Leap Sonata or without, uh, I know that people there are using this format and. Um, Seem to be quite committed to it. You know, the last, the last that I heard from them. No, Ramot says this is not the case. Right? They, they, it looks like they have um, updated the GitHub repository as of six days ago. So still pretty active. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So I think the rest of the questions are probably not for me. No. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Anton. Uh, so thank everyone for. Um, let me check. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining today's session. Uh, a lot of great speakers today. Uh, just a reminder that tomorrow uh, we'll have the second session with a lot of other great speakers. Um, uh, it starts at uh, 7 a.m. on the West Coast time, uh, 10 a.m. New York, and 3 p.m. London. So we hope to all see you there tomorrow. And if that's, I think that's all for today. Thank you. Bye. We can end the session.